Welcome to my review and thoughts on the 1989 movie, The Abyss. So, I'm not sure I would say I quite love this movie, but I come close to it. And the video will have some jokes, and I will get into at least a little serious stuff. Now, if you are looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. So I start the video with the review itself where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. Now, the movie is rated R. Oh, wow. It's okay. Never mind. I saw that wrong. It's rated PG 13. Okay. Despite the. Oh, right. Because the. Yes. Yeah, because the standards have changed. I. I think on language. Yeah. On language alone, this would have gotten uh, an R if it came out. Or, you know, there's there's 25 uses of the S word, so... But yeah, I... There's only one F word in the movie itself, so I will not be... Swear, I'll not be using a lot of F bombs. I might use some S. We'll, we'll see. But, yeah, so, for anyone bothered by harsh language, be aware of that. But yeah, uh, you know... James Cameron tends to make R-rated movies. I don't... This didn't feel like it was really constrained by the PG-13 rating. You know, I get... I guess it's this and the Avatar movies. I, I think those are the only... I think even Titanic is an R. C certainly, most of the movies. You know, your Terminators, Aliens... I'm almost certain True Lies as well, so yeah. Now, that brings us to... Yes, the version I'm going off for this video is the Special Edition Director's Cut. I have also watched the theatrical cut. I would definitely say, you know, yeah, the, the Special Edition is the better of the two. I'm not going to be comparing them that much in this video. There's some great details in the IMDb alternate version section if you want details. All I will say in comparing, the special edition fleshes out characters and relationships, and there is a major element that completely changes the film, especially the ending. So if you watched the theatrical and hated the ending, there's some chance the special edition will completely fix it, and some chance it'll make it worse. That's what some people have experienced, and, you know, fair enough. Now, this is... Uh, let's see, I think this is only my second viewing. Uh, for, for some years, I didn't have access to this, otherwise I probably would have. It's... I guess it's the movie... Yeah, it's the... Well, let's say, oh, uh, Titanic is also... Yeah, this and Titanic are the only James Cameron movies that I've watched twice. I've only watched Avatar 2 once, but I will be watching that one again as soon as it hits... Uh, yeah, as soon as I have access to it. It's apparently... Yeah, it's... it's. I, I haven't been able to get my hands on a, a copy yet, and I very rarely watch movies in the theater more than once these days. Now, the first time I watched it was 2004. So yeah, almost 20 years ago. And, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, I, I'm a big fan of James Cameron, so I usually watch his movies multiple times. The, you know, they're also the kind of movies that you know, you, you go back to and, like, there's new stuff to appreciate. You you realize stuff, but yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, the movie is set in 1994. I, I'm not entirely sure why, but the, yeah, this and 
Terminator 2, for some reason he chose to say, no, 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 this is like, it's taking place five years later. Well, Terminator 2, it's to get John's age to a more workable, you know, if, if the movie was actually set in 91, he'd be, what, six years old? That would be kind of messed up considering some of that movie. So, but yeah, I... I do not know what and and it's actually kind of fun like obviously he had no idea but the the cold war ended before 1994 and it's very important to this movie so it actually like you kind of have to pretend okay i get you know in 1989 of course he didn't know that you know i guess it was later that year and then in 91 were the two major you know the the Berlin Wall fell in 89, and then 91 was the proper dissolution of the entire Soviet Union. So, so yeah. But, yeah, 1994, and, yeah, one critic puts it really well. An American nuclear sub goes down with all hands, and when some underwater oil drillers try to rescue them, they discover something in the abyss. And... That brings us... So yeah, before I start talking details about the technical aspects, let me start by saying the people are very talented, there's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display. And... Yes, let's get into the writing. So this was written by James Cameron. Uh, you know, he, he both wrote and directed. And as we all know, he is part man, part merman, who has to return to the sea every so often to survive. Now, the... Um, let's see. Yeah, so, where's the best ranking of James Cameron movies? I've watched all except for the following documentaries. Expedition Bismarck, Last Mysteries of the Titanic, Years of Living Dangerously, James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. So, the ones that he wrote and didn't direct... Worst to Best, Dark Fate, Rambo 2, Alita, and Strange Days. And I would definitely say that Strange Days, I remember as being really, really good. The others, there's, I would definitely say there's something I love about each of those movies, but I wouldn't quite call any of them a full success. Now, directed regardless of writer, keeping in mind that other than True Lies, I love all of them. They are all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. I'm ranking... All other than this one. At the end of the video, I will update the, the list with where I placed the abyss. So if that's what you want to know, you know, just skip to the end of the review section. True Lies, Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Titanic, Terminator 2, Aliens, and Terminator 1. Now, James Cameron likes to write alone. And... You know, but, yeah, essentially, like, he chose to write with other people for the Avatar sequels. Not the first Avatar, but the sequels. I feel like it's a little, it's a tiny bit too early to say if that was great, because certainly Avatar 2 is very similar to Avatar 1. But yeah, by and large, he writes these things himself, and that does mean that there's some stuff where he's... I saw a really great quote from a from a critic that the user review I think James Cameron is too talented a director to settle for working with James Cameron the writer and I think there's definitely some truth to that and this one definitely does have you know, one of one of the things that people point to is the dialogue, and that's definitely true. This, you know, there there's um there's one brief part of this that like for years was a meme. I don't know if it's still being memed, but like, it, yeah, I get, before memes were a thing, people were already making fun of. You know, it's the yeah, it's the thing when you know you never gave up on anything in your life. You know, for for years, I didn't even realize it was from here. It just, like, whenever someone referenced it in something, we knew, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's such a, yeah, 
it's it's a really ridiculous proportion. It's not really dialogue, and it doesn't quite qualify as monologue either. But but yeah, and some of the some of the character relationships here are also just. And I hate to criticize that because that is one of the movie's strengths. But there are a couple where it is like, okay, that's just that's a bit too. I know he doesn't like the word cliche. He prefers the word archetypal, and I think there's definitely a, some some truth to. It. He likes using archetypes. A couple of them are just a little bit too, yeah. You know, I, I hope that the Avatar sequels will show benefits of him writing with other people. And certainly, there's some really solid writing in Avatar 2 that, like, could have been in Avatar 1 that wasn't there. So, yeah. Now, but, but yeah, you know, he is pretty good at keeping character, you know, like, it's, it's, you know, all writing is difficult, but... Bad writing is a lot easier than good writing. It's a lot easier to make your story work if characters make bad choices that are out of character. Because, you know, the moment that you assemble some smart characters who tend to make good decisions, it's harder to make the movie work. You know, you in a, in a, it, it's going to sound crude, but I, I find that the majority of movies would not happen if everyone was making good decisions all the way through. I will grant there are some that don't quite fit that, but, you know, drama happens when things aren't going the way that, either as intended or as you would hope they go. And James Cameron is really good at keeping characters in character, and, like, if bad choices are made, you can understand why. It's not just, like, you know, a quick example... Paul W. S. Anderson has smart characters making ridiculous, just impossibly bad decisions for no good reason, you know. And yeah, I I think his movies would be a lot better. You know, that's that's ad added to the list. There's a long list of of things that Paul W. S. Anderson could do to make his movies better. So the movie has some plot twists and. I think that at least one of them is a tad too easy to figure out for the viewer. There's there's something there's set up very early in the movie, and then the payoff, the the reveal, happens much much later in the movie. And I I yeah I I'm going to talk about it in the in the first spoiler section, but certainly it is. Yeah, the the um, certainly in the first spoiler section, I have some suggestions for rewrites, but I, f I forget if I have notes specifically for that. But but certainly, yeah, a lot of stuff happens between the the setup and then the reveal, and like I think Cameron was hoping that you'd be so caught up in what you're seeing that you wouldn't try to think ahead. And I just, at the end of the day, it's, yeah, I, th I think that was, uh, yeah, un unfortunate. Other than that, some of the twists are good. <clears throat> and I don't think there are too many or too few. So, direction. So, I've got some MDB trivia quotes here. So... Yeah, um, Cameron was determined to actually film major portions of the movie underwater as he felt that the conventional way to shoot such scenes, slow motion filming on a set filled with smoke or in the ocean with stunt divers looked unconvincing while searching for a suitable tank for filming during pre-production. He was advised of a half-completed nuclear reactor facility in Gaffney, South Carolina that was intended to be used as a movie studio. And, let's see, yeah, the unfinished turbine pits were suggested to serve as the tank for principal photography. We saw the, this is, 
nuclear reactor housing, 50 foot tall bow, 240 feet in diameter, he decided that this structure was ideal as it could accommodate huge sets and its walls would not be visible on screen. And yeah, the reactor became the largest underwater set in the world at 7.5 million gallons and the turbine pit was used for miniature special effects filming. And, yeah, Cameron declared this the worst production he was ever involved with, a sentiment shared by many of the cast members. The difficulties of filming around and underwater put a great strain on both cast and crew, further complicated by Cameron's notorious perfectionism. Many of them have been quoted as saying they would never do a sequel or movie like The Abyss again. For Cameron, a director known to often collaborate with the same cast and crew members, this movie had suspiciously few people who worked with him again, including most of the entire cast, save for Michael Bean, composer Alan Silvestri, and director of photography Michael Salomon. Now, Bean had worked with him before, the other two hadn't, so this must have been one hell of a first impression on the other two, but, you know, Bean has many kind words to say about Cameron in in a lot of the you know I've I've seen a lot of interviews and yeah he he very rarely like you know he yeah so so yeah Michael Bean already liked working with James Cameron so he could kind of accept okay this is this is not great but you know there's still yeah so Let's see. Because, because yeah, you know, Michael Bean did return for, I guess, is that a spoiler? I'll just say that Michael Bean did appear in at least one James Cameron movie after this. And I, I don't think it was like a contract thing. I'm pretty sure it was legitimately, yeah. And, yeah, it's one of the first films to make proper use of CGI technology, which were done by George Lucas' special effects company, Industrial Light and Magic. The anim uh, yeah, some animated effects that would be put to use in James Cameron's next film, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, to create the liquid Terminator, the T-1000. And the idea for the film came to Cameron when he attended a science lecture about deep sea diving and liquid breathing in high school. He wrote a short story about a group of scientists in a laboratory at the bottom of the ocean on the edge of the Cayman Trench. When signs of life come from the trench, the scientists dive in one at a time, never to return or being heard of again. When the last remaining scientist follows them to find out what happened, he ends up in a depth-induced psychosis. And he was worried that a group of scientists, it didn't seem commercial to him, so he changed it to a group of blue-collar workers instead, changed the story around them. Ironically, Ghostbusters 2, a film about scientists, was one of the most successful films of its year, while The Abyss itself, while not a box office flop, was considered to be commercially disappointing. So that's, that's an interesting, although I mean, a lot of people wanted more Ghostbusters, whereas, you know... Like, this was the... I feel like this movie... You know, if, if James Cameron had worked on Alien 3, or if this had been Terminator 2, you know, the, the movies where, like, it was like, holy crap, you know, people wanted more. People wanted more Terminator, and, you know, Aliens, the, the it's a... Like, that's a franchise. I think it's... I wouldn't say that I hate any of the Alien films, but I feel like, you know, the first one, fantastic. Aliens, just, it's amazing. Like, so, it's so rare to see such a solid follow-up to something that, like, just, you know, and then you have Alien 3, which kind of just tries to be the first movie again, which would have been fine if it was the first sequel. I think... A lot of people, you know, they wanted something, they they didn't want to go back to that, you know, and it is, you know, Alien 3, it is nowhere near as good a movie as the first Alien, so just, you know, okay, I, I realized that back then, well, no, wait, yeah, by the time, yes, by the time Alien 3 came out, I'm pretty sure if you wanted to rewatch the first one, it would be 
aired on TV, and I think, did they maybe have VHS, Betamax, something like that at the time? So, anyway, you know, that's, the Alien is a franchise that people keep coming back to because they hope that the new movie will be as good as the first two movies, you know, and the same thing goes for Terminator, so, so it's, yeah, the, the, I, I admire Cameron for taking a chance and going in and saying, okay, I'm gonna make, because, like, on the, on the face of it, like, Terminator, you know, I feel like it's arguably a spoiler, I don't think you should know very much about Terminator before you sit down and watch it, but if you know, like, a thing about that movie, you probably think that's pretty cool, you know, even, like, if you're at all into science fiction, you're probably like, that, that sounds cool, and The Abyss, like, you know, there's something for that, like, I guess if you're really into, like, deep sea exploration, which I think, I don't know if James Cameron realizes that as much as he loves it, clearly he loves it, it's not, like, I don't know that it's as much of a, like, mainstream appeal thing as uh, Terminator and Aliens. And, yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, 40% of all live-action principal photography was actually shot underwater. And Orson Scott Card, famous bigot, described working with James Cameron as hell on wheels. He claimed, the, the famous bigot part, that was my addition, he claimed that Cameron was nice to him because Card could afford to walk away while Cameron was miserable and unkind to everyone else. Card also stated, unless he changes his way of working with people, I hope he never directs. I mean, that's, that's fair, because it's like, you know, that's a, that's, you know, you don't want him to be unkind. To, oh, wait, no, there's more of the quote. Anything of mine... So you don't mind him being really, really unpleasant to people as long as it's not something of yours. Wow. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and yeah, Cameron contacted Card before filming began with the possibility of producing a book based on the film. Card initially told his agent he doesn't do novelizations, but when when she told him that the director was James Cameron, he agreed to consider it. The script arrived, Card signed on after receiving assurances from Cameron that he would be free to develop his novel the way he wanted. I don't know why novel is in quotes, but okay. The way he wanted to after a meeting with Cameron, Card immediately wrote the first three chapters, which dealt with events concerning Bud and Lindsay Brigman that occurred before the events of the film. And see, that almost makes me want to read it because that is that that's the way you, you would want something like yeah and Cameron gave these chapters to Ed Harris and Mary, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio the the two actors for those parts who used it to develop their characters so that's really cool as of 2019 this is the only narrative film you know not documentary directed by James Cameron not to debut at number one at the United States box office. And, and and I'm pretty sure that, yeah, as you know, I'm pretty sure Avatar 2 also debuted at number one. So, yeah, straight up, the only one that, uh, yeah. And I think also a lot of people who watched it once were kind of disappointed with aspects of it and told their friends, you know, so they didn't go and watch it again, which was, you know, a lot of his movies have gotten repeat, uh, you know, pe people would watch it more than once, you know, like I mentioned, because once you know everything that's in the movie, you can s sit and just, you know, really appreciate the, the artistry without, you know, being, being as, like, yeah. And, and, yeah, a lot of people didn't watch it more than once and told their friends not to watch it because it's, yeah. I will talk about it in the spoiler sections, but it's definitely a spoiler. And, yeah, since the Benthic Explorer model ship was so large and filmed on open seas, the production company was required to register it with the Coast Guard. So, once again, it's a model. You know, it's not a real... It's not the real ship, but it was so big, so so just yeah. Let's 
see, and yeah, um, during the segment where the mini subs are exploring the sunken nuclear sub, the actors can be seen inside the model mini subs. This was achieved by putting a tiny screen and projector inside the models, projecting it says movies, I, I, footage of the actors film specifically for that. That's that is really cool. That and it works. Like as I was watching the movie, I you know I caught myself thinking, how did they do? That? Oh right, uh, yeah, that's the. It's, you know, because I read how they did it before watching the movie, and it still worked on me. The masks were specially designed to show the actors' faces and had microphones fitted, so the dialogue spoken at the time by the actors could be used in the film. Let's see. And it, again, like, that's not, that's not something we're used to. We're used to the big thing where you, you can't really tell who is who. And that wouldn't work for this movie. That would take away from the drama. Because the they were designed to cleanly capture dialogue underwater, noise is created by the diving equipment were either isolated or filtered out. And there's actually... The, the DVD features this behind the scenes. And, like... I think there were at least three or four, like, were they all cast members? It's possible at least one was crew. All of them can do an imitation of the noise made it by the, this, this, yeah, the, the diving equipment. And, yeah, I really appreciate that they, like, it was, you know, the, the, it must have taken forever because it was like every few seconds, apparently, in real life, the the suit would would make this this noise uh, you know it was it was yeah the movie would would be hated if the if they hadn't removed the, the noises and let's see right and cameron did, felt the superior quality of the sound seemed artificial and the noises made by the regulators in the helmets were added during sound post-production. And yeah, yeah, the, they do make a little noise. It would it would feel really, really. Uh, uh, I don't think the word is fake. Artificial. It would feel really artificial if the if there was absolutely no noise, but they removed the really. Yeah, it was like a clicking noise, and it's like, you get why, you know, there's a there's a thing there. Of course, it's going to make noise as it's, but, but yeah, it would have been unbearable to listen to for, for audiences. Since it is supposed to be pitch black at the bottom of the sea, all the lighting had to come from the deep core rig and the submersibles. A special 1200 watt light source was specifically created for the film, which has since been used in many other movies, as well as by NASA. So, yeah, and let's see, right, and the, yeah, there's a, there's a part where someone punches someone else in the face. A single solid white frame is spliced in at the moment of impact. This film trick accurately conveys the flash a person sees when they get hit in the head. It was also used in Aliens whenever gunshots were fired and Terminator 2 Judgment Day in a major scene, in a, yeah, in something important and in True Lies. And the studio pushed hard for an Academy Award nomination for Michael Bean as Best Supporting Actor, but was unsuccessful, which is just, like, he's, he's amazing in this. And I, you know, I know I, I have nothing but praise for Michael Bean, but I swear, he really, this, this might be his best performance, at, at least that I know, that I know. Now, let's see. Right, and it's the first feature film to have used an early version of Adobe Photoshop. Okay, I suppose... Okay, the, the performance by Michael Bean in this is tied with the first Terminator, to be clear. But yeah, I would say... I mean, it's been forever since I watched Tombstone, but from what I recall, that one... It's, it's good, but it's not quite on the same level as this... Clock stoppers. I mean, he's trying. He's he's legitimately like he does 
what he can with with that, and the movie is much better for having him in it. Yes, I specifically watched that movie for Michael Bean. I I didn't, you know, it's cool that Jonathan Frakes directed it. Don't get me wrong, but it was it was for Michael Bean, and I was not disappointed. I wouldn't say that he is amazing in Cherry Falls. He's fine. He is. He's amazing in Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. He's not particularly good in Aliens Colonial Marines. And, you know, he says he, he felt that the, you know, the people working on the game weren't passionate about it. So he did, you know, that disappointed him. So he didn't feel he could give as good of a performance. That's probably the only bad performance of his that I, that I know of. Now... Let's see, this was the first movie to shop out special effects over multiple companies, seven in total. This has since become commonplace in Hollywood as a way to spread the burden of work, allowing each company to be used to its strengths and preventing one company to get swamped in work, which can co cause costly delays. Let's see, and... Yeah, for a while, the for financial reasons, the deep core set wasn't dismantled. It was... It was eventually demolished in 2007 during a reconstruction project, but yeah, you know, some, sometimes we forget, you know, it's, it's expensive to build a set, but it's also expensive to take it back apart, you know, man hours, tools, so yeah. And yeah, it was filmed on a $70 million budget, making it one of the most expensive films made at the time. And... Despite the fact that the water tank was heated with gas burners, many cast and crew got so cold during filming that plastic hot tubs were set up outside the tank to keep them warm during breaks. And the mini subs and the wide shots were actually models suspended on wires in a smoky environment and filmed in slow motion. So it wasn't, you know, they weren't able to completely do without that kind of filming underwater stuff. But yeah. And. Let's see, so, right, Steven Spielberg studied special, the effect sequences in this as well as Terminator 2 and Young Sherlock Holmes to prepare for Jurassic Park. The effects for, right, yeah, the effects for all four productions were done by ILM. Yeah, this this was written a while ago because it keeps saying George Lucas's effects company. I, aren't they Disney by now because of the whole... Uh, anyway, and the... Um, Let's see. Right. Kathleen Quinlan, Jessica Lange, Deborah Winger, and Barbara Hershey were considered to play Lindsay Brigman. Now, I gotta say, I don't think I know Barbara Hershey from anything, but the other three are, are talented. I, I would say they, they could have done it. And Cameron almost cast Jamie Lee Curtis, but Kathleen Bigelow, his future wife, had already cast her in Blue Steel from 1990. You know, and and they did work together on True Lies uh, five years later. Mary Elizabeth Master Antonia was finally chosen on the strengths of her perform on the strength of her performances in Scarface, where she is amazing. Like that, I think that was actually like her debut, and she's like, was she maybe twenty when they fell? It, it was like it's ridiculous how bit like. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was Brenda Palma personally or, you know, casting direct probably, but someone saw, no, she can do it. She's, you know, because she's a really important, like, if she was bad in that movie, so much of the movie doesn't work. You know, her character, I don't know if I want to give away exactly what she plays, but her character is extremely important. You know, she's, she's very important to... Tony Montana, the, the protagonist, as played by Al Pacino, you know, so, yeah. Uh, let's see, and the color of money, I don't think I... The color of money? No, no, I haven't watched that one. Let's see. Yeah, and the, the original idea for the film came to James Cameron when at age 17 in high school, he attended a science lecture about deep-sea diving by Francis J. Falchuk, 
was the first human to breathe fluid through his lungs in experiments conducted by Dr. Johannes A. Kilstra, A. Kilstra. And let's see, yeah, so he, he shot, he wrote a short story. Many of the details evolved over the years, although the basic idea did not change. And then, while making Aliens, Cameron saw a National Geographic film about remote operated vehicles operating deep in the North Atlantic Ocean. These images reminded him of a short story after going scuba diving with Gail and her during their honeymoon near the Cayman Trench. He knew he wanted to make this his next movie. And... Yeah, you know, he, he quickly realized scientists running experiments were not that appealing to an audience, so he changed it to a group of blue-collar workers drilling for oil on the bottom of the sea. Yeah, I guess back when this was made, I don't think oil drilling was as, you know, controversial as it is today, with many of us on the left saying, you're literally destroying nature, you're displacing people, we have alternatives, so knock it off. The studio was considering Mel Gibson, Dennis Quaid, William Hurt, Harrison Ford, Kurt Russell, and Patrick Swayze for the role of Bud Brigman. All of them would definitely have been able to, yeah. It's, you know, the, the, um, yeah. James Cameron suggested Ed Harris. The studio was concerned about his lack of experience as lead. Oh, that's right. Lack of experience as leading man. Oh, he's, he's great in it. Let's see. As well as his receding hairline. Wow. Yeah, that's... That's... That, that's... That's enough. That's how shallow a lot of Hollywood can be that a receding hairline means you can't be a leading man. And Cameron felt the receding hairline added to his everyman appeal. And, uh, yeah, I agree. Let's see. And, yeah, Harris convinced the studio with a screen test where he wore, wore a motorcycle helmet as a diving helmet. Right, and James Cameron, yeah, James Cameron's two choices for Bud were Ed Harris and Jeff Bridges, who would definitely also, yeah, I could, I could totally see that. Let's see. I mean, I'm not unhappy that the role did not go to Mel Gibson, since we know he's a horrible anti-Semitic, yeah. But yeah, someone, you know, Patrick Swayze, R.I.P., could definitely, I, I could definitely see that. I haven't watched a huge amount of, of his movies, but he's great in Ghost. He's, he's so good that you actually end up kind of not realizing that his character does some some things that are maybe like don't do that and let's see um yeah and and one there's a, yeah a a close up shot from near the end of the movie, was filmed after principal photography in Gail Ann Hurd's pool. Because that was less expensive, you know, than the than the giant million gallons. Uh, yeah, so that's, yeah. It's, it's movies like this and Titanic that make you wonder what on earth was going through... Let's see, who was it that directed, was, let's see, Waterworld, oh, that was directed by Kevin Reynolds. What was going through, I, I'm not sure if it was his decision, but what was going through whoever's mind that made the decision that they would shoot it out at sea rather than, like, they could legit just have filmed it in the tank that was used for this movie. It's big enough that the... Yeah. Anyway, that's like, if you know anything about filmmaking, like, it's... Like, what... Intern who wanted revenge for having to do all the shitty jobs came up with the idea to shoot it out at sea, where you literally, that means you have to transport 
everything that is needed to make a movie out there instead of just having water close to a place where you can have the anyway let's see right and there's yeah there are underwater tracking shots in this and Cameron and his brother Mike invented a novel underwater camera vehicle called the Sea Wasp, which allowed camera operators to move the camera independently of the vehicle's glide path. So, yeah, that's that's legitimately really, really... Yeah. And, and that, you know, it wouldn't be a James Cameron movie if the camera work was not exquisite. So... Of course, they had to come up with something special for actual underwater photography where, like, sure, you, you know, before this, you could film, you know, there's Jacques Cousteau, you know, documentaries and such, but it was, like, documentary footage, you know, where it's, like, no, no, no like, let's, let's make sure we get the, the subject in frame and you know, make sure that you can keep filming as long as, you know, until you get all the footage you want. That's, you know, not, not to belittle that. It's still, you know, still hard work. But it's not filmed to, to have, like, a dramatic impact on the, the viewer the way that a fictional movie. Now, let's see. Right, in the original storyline, when, when uh, let's see, yeah, Lindsay at one point explains why she's always so hard on people. She grew up in a family with five older brothers, and she had to fight for everything, even to be noticed. It's, it's too bad that isn't in the movie, because a lot of people really hate her character, and that does really explain a lot. And it's completely realistic. Now, let's see... Special effects supervisor John Bruno tried to get director James Cameron to hold his Oscar for best special effects after the award ceremony due to all the anguish the director had to endure on the set and Cameron reportedly refused, you know, because that's that's John, that's John Bruno's Oscar and certainly, yeah, John Bruno earned it. It's, you know, amazing effects as usual for James Cameron movies, directed by James Cameron movies. And let's see. Um, right. Bud and Lindsay's rocky relationship may have been an unconscious mirror of the divorce that James Cameron was going through at the time with producer Gail Ann Hurd. After finishing Aliens, 1986, Hurd had gone off to produce Alien Nation. While Cameron was preparing for the abyss, by the time the film was greenlit, they had grown apart and had already split am am amicably. But Cameron still decided that he didn't want to do the movie without her producing. While the divorce was being finalized, Cameron was dating director Catherine Bigelow during weekend breaks on the abyss, and they married shortly after completion of the film. Now. Chris Elliott originally auditioned for the role of Alan Hippie Carnes, but didn't get the part. He was eventually cast as Bendix instead, which that is one of my issues with this movie. There is entirely too little Chris Elliott. Like, I will grant that it is hard to satisfy my desire for Chris Elliott in movies, you know, but how wild is it that one of the few that actually gets fairly close is, like, Scary Movie 2? Like, who, how... I realize, since he's a comedic actor, that is a comedy, that, you know, there's... But, like, no, it just... I absolutely love him. I was always... When, when I was a, a kid watching... You know, kid and teenager watching a lot of sitcoms, it made my day when he guessed. You know, guessed... Yeah, guested you know, whether we're talking Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I, I feel like, was he on Just Shoot Me? I think he was at least once. Um, yeah, those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. But yeah, 
big big fan of, of his. I find him just like gut bustingly funny. And he would have killed it as as hippie, but yeah. Let's see. That, yeah, that's right. This is the first and only time Alan Silvestre has compu composed the musical score for a James Cameron film. And Right, Al Giddings was hired to do the underwater photography on the strength of his work on The Deep from 1977, which I gotta say, I have not watched that. And, let's see. Yeah, um, aside from Michael Bean and Captain Kid Brewer Jr., R.I.P., who had briefly appeared in Piranha 2 The Spawning, there are none of the usual regulars who work with James Cameron in this movie. Schwarzenegger, Lance Henriksen, Bill Paxton, Jeanette Goldstein, etc. Henriksen was briefly considered for a part, but was unavailable. And that is, like, for sure, there's no part for Schwarzenegger in this. I feel like Paxton could have... There's no character in this that plays to all the strengths of Bill Paxton, R.I.P., so that's maybe why. Yeah, I don't know who Jeanette Goldstein would have played... Henriksen, yeah, there's a, there's, there's definitely at least one role he could have played in this. Now, let's see, so yeah, Deep Star 6 from 89 was the first release of several underwater monster-themed feature films released during 89 and 90, including this, Leviathan from 89, The Evil Below 89, Lords of the Deep 89, The Rift 8, K.A. Endless Descent, 1990, and none of the other films were box office hits. Let's see. Yeah, this is one of only two James Cameron films not to be scored by James Horner, Brad Fidel, or Simon Franklin. Let's see. Yeah, Michael Bean also played Navy SEAL in the film's Navy SEALs, which makes a lot of sense, from 1990, and The Rock from 96, and Ed Harris is also in the... yeah, it says it stars... yeah, yeah, true, stars Ed Harris. And... let's see... <clears throat> right, James Cameron's trademark title fade at the beginning of the movie, the blue Y from the opening credits, extends and then fades to the underwater scenery, with the submarine, like, this is how you do opening to, like, you know, most movies will, you know, some, some now place them at the end, at the start of the end credits, but, like, movies tend to have the title appear on screen, either at the start or at the end, you know, make it visually appealing, make it, do, do something with it, you know, there's no reason not to, really, I mean, I guess if you spend all the money, some you know, if you've spent all the money before you get to that, or like you just don't have someone who has a really cool idea for it working on the movie. Other than that, do something with it. Like you got it's it's yeah. Or you know, if if you made the movie, if the movie was made before the technology was there to uh, yeah. Another James Cameron trademark, strong female lead, Lindsay Brigman, is ambitious, combative, and willing to make sacrifices. And, let's see... Right, and, and the safety conditions were um, major... Conditions were also a major factor with the installation of a decompression chamber on site, along with a diving bell and a safety diver for each actor. So Cameron has said in an interview that he wanted to make 2001 Space Odyssey, but underwater. And he felt that if it didn't live up to that, he would have failed. And, I mean, it's not as philosophical and, like, brain, you know, like, mind-blowing as 2001. But certainly, if we're talking verisimilitude, yes. It, it absolutely, yeah. and, and some really compelling, memorable sets, and so, you know, I, I'm not sure I would, does this have anything that's quite as, like, 2001, I swear, 
I'm not going to spend this the rest of the video gushing over Stanley Kubrick, R.I.P., who, to be clear, was also a, you know, he was a real bastard when it came to how he treated some of his actors and, and crew and such. What I will say is, the you know, that movie has the bit where the... the is it the protagonist? It's a it's a major character, certainly. It's been years since I watched it, but that shot sticks with you. You know where he's running in a circle. He's there's this circular zero G thing where he's running, and the camera. You know, it's, you've got the you've got the that gorgeous, you know, Stanley Kubrick tracking shot. You know, I'm I'm not sure I would say that this movie has anything quite as, you know, memorable and amazing as that. But it definitely has, you know, I, I saw one person say that it has a strong sense of place. Each of the, you know, because at the end of the day, like, it's shot on, it's, it, yeah, it's shot on sets. You know, none, none of these places exist in the real world. Certainly not the way they look in the movie, but the movie convinces you Oh, they're they're actually deep underwater when you know. It's it's. You know, yeah. For some of it, they are actually underwater, but like a lot of it, it's just the the yeah. It's a set, and yeah, each of the places feel real. We get great intros to all the characters, and the start sets up important things for later. Now. Military men and aliens are unserious, and here there are two serious in contrast to the fun-loving civilians. You know, in, in this, it's the civilians who are, like, joking and having a good time and such. Not, you know, they still take their job seriously, but anyway. And, yeah, you know, in that one, at least one military person loses self-control, and, you, you know, watching this, you wonder, might that happen here? And this is not a spoiler, because the idea is set up very early on, because Cameron hates the Vietnam War, which is very understandable, and not all military men are all bad in either of these. And like all James Cameron movies, it is primarily a love story. This one, it's about a marriage that is currently dissolving, and, you know, can it be saved? And realism is high in most aspects, which really makes the few parts where it isn't stand out. And when characters are in a bad situation, unless there is a very clear, distinct, and understandable reasons why reason why not, the characters will be logical and try to solve the problems with usually scientifically sound methods, instead of like arguing with each other. You know, other parts of the movie has people arguing with each other, but when things like when when you need to focus and and you know not finger point, you know there might be finger pointing after they've dealt with the the issue but not during because that's just you know that doesn't make any sense and these people have all you know the characters they're used to this is not the first time that they're you know the seals it's the first time that they're diving quite as deep or wait there's there's something ab about that you know but the crew have all gone really re the, the civilian crew have all gone really deep before now, let's see. Right, one create quote. The, the movie creates a fascinating vision of the ocean floor. The sets are incredibly well done, giving a real sense of a lived in, confined underwater space. Uh, Cameron's directing does an extraordinary job heightening the tension and suspense, full of mystery and intrigue. The abyss is a thrilling journey into the unknown fathoms of the deep. Very, very true. Yeah, he's, he's so good at making sets feel lived in. Because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of sets are built for the specific movie that the, you know, yeah. Now, let's see. You know, I've, so, so yeah, right. Uh, the As far as, like, genre, you know, IMDb calls it an adventure drama mystery. That makes a lot of sense. I've seen some people suggest that the movie is partially a horror movie. While obviously what scares you is very subjective, in my opinion, this movie is not scary to watch. Evidently, it was terrifying to work on. 
you know, and I am one of the people who consider the first Terminator part horror movie. Let's see the yeah, so I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the uh, the ending does not entirely fit what came before and what people were expecting. I I'm not I don't hate the ending, but I definitely think it could be you know that that is like occasionally Cameron will have a banger of a movie and a very underwhelming ending. You know, it's, yeah, I, I don't think, certainly I do think the special edition is better, but they're, they're both kind of meh, and yeah, a number of critics also don't like, and yeah, and there's definitely some convenient writing in the ending. Now, the... That brings us to the characters. So, I don't think I really have more to say about Ed Harris. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead. You know, his full character name is Virgil Bud Brigman. He's Deep Core's foreman. Anne Lindsay's estranged husband. Now, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio is Dr. Lindsay Brigman. She designed the, the rig and it's James Cameron and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio really are a match made in heaven. It's too bad, though completely understandable, that she didn't want to work with him after this. She's so good at playing badass women, and he's really great at writing and directing them. You know, you've got this, you've got her Maid Marian. You know, the the I don't know if I guess she's not a badass, but she definitely speaks her mind in Scarface, you know, like just you could you could easily see how the the you know the two of them could work together over and over on but then I suppose he doesn't tend to he he uses some of the same like Jeanette Jeanette Goldstein, he's put in three of his movies, but she's only a badass in one of them. Yeah, he does tend to... The, the, the women he directs to be badasses tend to be badass in one movie each. But then I'm not sure that a lot of them would have made... Like, I don't think... I, I love, you know... Jamie Lee Curtis and Sigourney Weaver are two of my favorite actresses, especially when it comes to playing strong women. As much, you know, Sigourney Weaver is amazing in the Alien quadrilogy. I don't think she would have been quite as good. Well, let's see. Yeah, yeah, really any of the other strong women that Cameron has written and directed. So, yeah. Now the so yeah one one critic gave it a six out of ten and said that the worst part is Lindsay she almost destroyed she destroyed almost the whole movie with her overconfident and masculine behavior I would love to find out if this person just hates masculinity when it's women displaying it or if it's like in a general because I can I can definitely get behind. Like, uh, you know, masculinity has caused a lot of problems. It's, uh, toxic masculinity especially, but just like the male insecurity is, is at the, uh, is the, the root of so many of our biggest, longest running problems as a species. But I, I can't help but know, there's a lot of people who can't handle when women are masculine, even though a lot of feminine traits are not seen as positive, especially in this kind of, like, I hesitate to call it an action movie, but certainly a movie with tension, you know. So, anyway. 
And yeah, the, this person goes on to say, without her, the movie could easily could be easily nine. And let's see. Yeah, one person says it, the film is just so painfully boring to sit through. I don't understand that at all. But anyway, they go on to say it didn't help that I didn't like any of the characters. Which that's that's fair. Not you know he he has a very specific way of of doing characters. And the soap opera between Bud and his wife was more annoying than anything. See that I definitely I I don't like when when you do like oh this is a this is a strained relationship between a man and a woman, and they're just like arguing over and over. I really don't think that's particularly interesting. But I realize, you know, for a long time, Hollywood felt that, what else are you going to do? You know, it's not like they're adults who could just sit down and have a mature conversation. No, they have to just be arguing over and over and over. And that is definitely something. But it didn't, like, the, 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 the character is nowhere near as misogynistically handled as the Jimmy Lee Curtis, uh, Helen Tasker in True Lies, you know, so, yeah, and, and, like, it's not every single time she's on screen that she's arguing with him, it's just, there's, there are, more, more, on more than one occasion in this movie, the two of them will get into an argument about some, you know, one of them will, to express frustration at a particular character trait of the other one, you know, and yeah, they'll they'll get into an argument, and the arguments also don't like last an eternity. And yeah, um, so the following is from a critic. This this is from a um, a review from eighty nine. Dubbed the queen bitch of the universe, Lindsay is the terror of the tightly knit nine-person crew. Like Ripley and aliens, she is a fembo, an unfeeling and therefore a natural female. I don't think this person paid attention to either of these, if that's the takeaway. No feeling. Ripley feels nothing for Newt. Lindsay feels nothing for Bud. Come on. And this was written by a woman. Internalized misogyny at its finest. Fine-boned but steel-souled Master Antonio, who is introduced almost as misogynistically as possible for the first 20 minutes, but gradually resolves into one of those proficient, smart, resourceful, haughty but still accessible women women who Cameron can't help respecting. Let's see. Yeah, she's very good. Every moment of her acting is indelible. Yeah, because of the depth of emotion and precision precision yes now let's see right almost every performance is excellent otherwise except Christopher Murphy who Cameron appears to have cast from a weightlifting advertisement in particular Ed Harris and Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio both are good throughout it's really a uh, yeah there's one particular part where they really excel Harris can't... Uh, oh, right. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. Spectacular acting from the two of them. So much so when they finally get... Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's... I really... Uh, I don't know why her character is so so hated. I get why Bud hates her because they're, they argue a lot. And a lot of people hate the person that... You know, the... the um, they are in the in those in this movie. They are in the process of getting divorced. And again, you know, said very early on, it hasn't been finalized. But basically, like they are going through the paperwork. You know, if you know much about divorce, you know that it's not like a one day to the next day kind of thing. There's a lot. You know, it's a process. And yeah, basically, he is. You know, he hopes that they'll get back together. She doesn't really think that that's particularly, yeah. Which I also appreciate, you know, he's the, the sort of romantic of the two of them. He's the one who still has hope for the relationship. 
when a lot of movies, a lot of American movies, it's like, no, 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 women like love. Men, they just kind of tolerate it, and that's just not true. Like, you, you have a very, very limited experience of, of men when it comes to matters of love, if you think that men don't feel love. That's, like, holy crap, I really, I feel bad for you if you've never seen a man who was in love with his partner. That's, yeah. Now, Michael Bean plays U.S. Navy SEAL Lieutenant Hiram Coffey, the commander of the Navy SEAL team. Cameron regular Michael Bean has a career best performance here, and I hope Cameron brings Bean back into the fold with his Avatar sequels. Honestly, yeah, seriously. Now, other critics think that he is overacting, and... <laughs> The, the yeah this this following quote is pretty funny during character work by sporting a gay porn mustache is not nearly the asset to this film that he was to the terminator aliens despite it being such a plumly showcased role that that is that is true but yeah excellent performance and yeah i you know it's a very different role from like i feel like his, uh, his, Kyle Reese, and what is, what is the character name in Alien? See, I always accidentally mix up, I guess maybe because the other character does also, Hicks, that's right, Paxton is Hudson, Bean is Hicks, I feel like Hicks is, you know, I feel like Kyle Reese is where Hicks would be after several more years of war, or if the, you know, certainly years of seemingly hopeless war, you know, Hicks seems to think, no, no, we can win this, that's fine, no problem at all, you know. So, yeah, the, the, this role is very, very different from what Cameron usually asks of Michael Bean, and the fact that he does such a good, like, he throws himself into it. You know, some, some actors, when they're being asked to, to, you know, play a very different role than, you know, otherwise, they'll be like, okay, I guess I'll do it, you know, if you think I can. And, and the performance kind of ends up suffering as a result. And here, it's very much like, okay, he won 100%, you know, just, yeah. Now, let's see, the Leo Burmeiser plays Catfish DeRees, a worker on the rig, Vietnam veteran Marine, who's skeptical of the SEALs. Todd Graff plays Alan Hippie Carnes, conspiracy theorist, who believes, right, um, something about something in this movie. John Bedford Lloyd plays Jammer Willis. J.C. Quinn, Arliss, Sonny Dawson. Kimberly Scott plays Lisa, Lisa One Night Standing. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't remember on this viewing, I didn't remember anything about her character from, from the first, um, you know, I, I didn't remember very much of the movie, period. Uh, you know, I, again, it's really, really cool that Cameron actually did have at least a little bit of diversity. You know, Master Antonio, you know, not being a... Ah, crap. Is she? Is she Lat... I guess she's not Latina, but certainly, you know, not the the exact same, you know... Yeah, she's, she's at least slightly more ethnic than, like, yeah... Now, and, and, yeah, you know, Kimberly Scott, black woman, and the, you know, James Cameron doesn't have her just be a stereotypical black woman from, you know, the 80s, kind of, so, so, yeah, really appreciate that, and, yeah, I mean, the fact that they refer to her as one night, you know, her 
her given name is Lisa Standing. I, I'm not entirely sure. Having rewatched the movie, I'm not entirely sure if there is supposed to be a thing of like, oh, she's having a lot of one night stands, or if it's just that they thought that was kind of a, a funny, you know. I mean, certainly, like, the, the character of Alan Hippie Carnes. You know, it's not spelled the exact same way as hippie. You know, it's, it ends in a Y instead of IE, but I feel like that's the. Yeah. And. So, so yeah, I, I don't know if it's supposed to be one night stand. You know, I, I was wondering if the movie was going to paint it as bad in a moralistic manner or if it was would acknowledge there's nothing wrong with one night stands, but. Ultimately, there's there's not really either, and I'm left unsure if her character does have one night stands or they just thought it was kind of a funny thing to, yeah. Anyway, she isn't upset at that being, so maybe she has one night stands and the movie just doesn't get into that aspect of the character. Maybe someone on the crew thought it would be funny to call her that, and she agreed. She never has an issue with it so yeah regardless you know and it's like camaraderie like it's fine to have like to give nicknames to your friends as long as they're cool with it and you know I'm not gonna speak for everyone but I do know a number of women especially in this kind of, you know it's a very male dominated field oil drilling it's, it's thought of as a, a masculine thing not a not a feminine thing you know, like, hypothetically, a feminine thing might be if she was a nurse or a doctor at a hospital, you know, but, yeah, so, so the, yeah, it's, it, as long, yes, a number of women do want to be treated as one of the guys when they are in a male-dominated field. Not everyone, but some do, and, yeah, it seems like she is, you know, her character is one of those who who just yeah she just wants to you know it's not that she doesn't have opinions of her own it's not that there's no kind of but yeah she is she wants to just be one of the crew now uh, right captain kid brewer jr rip plays lou findler george robert click plays wilhite christopher murphy plays shenick Adam Nelson plays Ensign Monk, and the three of them are U.S. Navy SEALs. Chris Elliott as Bendix, Richard Warlock as Dwight Perry, Jimmy Ray Weeks as Leland McBride, J. Kenneth Campbell as DeMarco, William Wisher Jr. as Bill Tyler, a reporter, and Ken Jenkins as Gerard Kirkhill. And if you feel like you recognize the name and or face of William Wisher Jr., he... You know, he, uh, yeah, he helped James Cameron write The Terminator, let's see, write and Terminator 2, and he, you know, in The Terminator, he has, yeah, he has a cameo appearance as 1L19, a police officer, and he also has a cameo appearance in Terminator 2, and it's not completely clear, but there is some like you could you could definitely infer that it's the same character because the way he reacts to seeing Schwarzenegger you know yeah so so yeah i it's 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 cool that that you know yeah every so often he'll <clears throat> he'll have an on-screen role now let's the this is not the first time I've lost my voice recently. I okay <clears throat> started to lose my voice at least. Every single supporting character has at least one quirk or character trait that makes you remember them all. And like every James Cameron directed movie, the characters are ones that I want to spend more time with. You know pick a James Cameron movie, and yes, I would be very happy to spend more time with those characters. 
let's see, and right, on some more critic quotes, the other supporting characters are totally memorable and likable because of their humanity, and that's what James Cameron does best. And after seeing this movie, you can remember all their names right off the bat, so they each got their gimmicks. Let's see, like Predator and Aliens, the movie makes you care about and want to see an individual movie on each character, showing you more of him, her. But the world ain't perfect, so we never, may never get to see that happen. Let's see, and... Yeah, one person said, you know, even though the movie is three hours long, like 97% of it revolves around these characters, you don't really care that much about them, and that's, you know, that's some people's experience, not mine. <coughs> hmm. Now, hmm. Yeah, one person said that other than Ed Harris and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, the rest of the crew is something you might find on a TV sitcom. They all seem miscast. Yeah, as I I disagree, but you know it's it's a subjective. Yeah. And. Yeah, you know, she's a Master Antonio is a fine actress, but I didn't believe her being a member of an of a deep sea vessel one bit. Her casting seems a bit of a stretch. <coughs> right, compliment another critic says complimenting the equipment is a cast that looks at home in working gear. And yeah, the the Deep Core team is a group with the rough camaraderie of Aliens Colonial Marine Corps. And supporting wise, Todd Graff, Kimberly Scott, Leo Burmeister are all great in the most vocal and funny roles. John Bedford Lloyd is also good in a much quieter part. And you know, as usual for a James Cameron movie, the women actually come across as if they've lived as women you know the the people will underestimate them and you know make make yeah make make comments about them being women and they you know you can tell that this is not the first time they've heard you know in in aliens you have the thing of Hey Vasquez, have you ever been mistaken for a man? No, have you? You know, clearly it's not the first time that a guy says, "Wow, you're really masculine." You know, and she has, she, yeah, she, you know, she probably has like dozens of of ready replies to people saying shit like that. You know, to her. So it's it's yeah. Let's see. So, the dialogue, I won't reveal... Uh, right. The IMDb quote section has 63, and I think all of them are worth looking up. I don't think I will get into how many of them I think are good. Um, it's, it's fine. You know, it's not, like, painful, but it is... Yeah, I have a few quick... Yeah. First, I won't reveal how many there are, but there is at least one scene where characters have to hurry to get from one place to another, and it's almost like James Cameron is going for parody. I'm pretty sure he goes through every single cliche saying in this part. You've got go, 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 move, all right, all right, everybody brace for impact, character name, character name, can you hear me? Get the hell out of there. The thing is going to be, the, the thing is going to bad thing. Like, just, yeah. And one critic says, Cameron's dialogue is made up of either bold statements of fact or smart wisecracks. Never are the audience or characters allowed to think. I wonder if they meant this. And that's definitely, yeah, I, I that wasn't something I had really put words to before, but now I can't unhear it. You know, it's just, that's exactly, yeah, 100% ac accurate description. So... That brings us to the cinematography. So once again, this is handled by Michael. Oh, he's Danish. Okay, well in that case, I'm guessing it's pronounced 
Mikhail Salomon. I'm Danish myself, and oh, that's right. He's he also direct. He's he's directed 47 things. So that's that's cool. I don't. Th oh, he directed some of the Andromeda Strain miniseries. Yeah, that was pretty good. I don't think. Oh, he direct what what episode of Alias? Parody the the third episode. Can't place it, but most of season one is great, so I can imagine. Oh, Hard Rain. Not, I didn't love that, but I wouldn't say it's badly directed. I, I'd say the issues are in the script. But yeah, as cinematographer, he shot Far and Away, Backdraft, Arachnophobia. Let's see, is there anything else? Oh, and then we get to a bunch of Danish. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Oh, there's actually yeah, there's there's a a few things that I know, a few of his Danish. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Very cool. Anyway, um but but yeah, you know, he does a really solid job like it's not some you know, hot take that James Cameron's movies are really well shot, but, you know, this actually did have to... There's there's some adaptation going on, you know. Most of his movies are filmed on land, you know, with, with actors in regular settings, and, yeah, the, the filming is amazing here, uh, you know. The, the you've got a lot of underwater footage, but you've also got like really cramped settings because the thing is like if you're building something that's gonna go underwater, you don't want it to be any bigger than you know, there there's not really supposed to be like great leg room and place to really stretch out the you know, that's the kind of thing that we take for granted here on land. But if you you know every anything you build that you put deep underwater has to be able to with it has to be able to, to withstand pressure it has to be able to like the the um it has to be completely I guess watertight is the word you know if it lets even in even a little bit of water you know tick tock it's just a matter of time before you can't so, so it has to be completely tight and just, yeah, you, they don't tend to make those things any bigger than they have to be for the thing they're supposed to do down there, you know. So, so yeah, um, and, and, you know, 1989, cameras were still pretty big, so they had to, he had to plan for, okay, there's got to be room for the camera and the, the characters without like yeah so so amazing job on that and i don't know if it's i guess if you know you know but yeah das boot is indeed the the german you know movie about a submarine you know is something i put up behind me and i'm not the first person to point out that there's definitely you know, some, some inspiration going on there. Th this took some inspiration from that movie because of this with the, the cramped quarters and, yeah, and, and, yeah, something you see in that movie is there's really only just as much room as is absolutely necessary. You know, it's, it's a military submarine. So there's, I forget, maybe a couple dozen people just needed to run the thing, you know, and they have almost no sp space to themselves. Like they, they have, they have a bed each, and like a t tiny bit of room. But like, yeah. So, so it's, and and the movie makes it feel like you know, it it feels convincing that the the people we're following are used to live in these cramped quarters. Now, that brings us to the editing. Right. This was edited by Conrad Buff the third, the fourth, rather. 
Joel Goodman, Stephen Quayle, and Howard E. Smith. And, you know, it's one of those things, like, there's so much work that it makes sense to, to split it up over multiple people. Just, yeah. And... Yeah, they do a really, really great job. There, I do have a couple of issues with, uh, like, I, th I feel like this movie should have been trimmed down, but ultimately it's a writing issue, not a editing issue. They could not have done that much. Uh, the, the um, ah, what's it called? Um... They, yeah, they couldn't have just edited the movie to, to make it way shorter than now. And, and I will talk about the things that I would change to, on a script level, to make it not be so long. And, right, that brings us to box office. So yeah, this the budget was between 43 and 47 million dollars and the box office was only 90. Now, for 89, that's not like today that's a disaster if you're a studio person. Back then it wasn't like a completely devastating, you know, it's it so it made back its budget and made you know, yeah, it made its budget back twice, I guess is how to properly phrase that and yeah for 89 that was acceptable you know it is legitimately amazing despite some of the movies like going over budget going over time and Cameron himself thinking this is it this is the last you know this movie is going to lose so much money James Cameron every single movie he has directed has done pretty well at least you know that this one did okay the rest of them have done like amazing business you know so yeah he's just he has a he has his finger on the pulse he knows what people want to see in movies and you know he doesn't make hateful movies like michael bay who clearly also understands what people want to see in movies so the this was this wasn't filmed so much on location as the the you know it was it was more studio let's see is there any um but but yeah and i i mentioned you know it was the Cherokee nuclear power plant in Gaffney South Carolina and yeah various let's see and it was filmed between the 15th of August in 88 and the 8th of December, also 88. Which also tells you, holy crap, that is, yeah. So, August, let's see. I can never remember the, the order of, the, yeah, so half of August, all of September, October, November, and some of December. Yikes. That is a long shooting. Yeah. Now the... Let's see. Right. So I personally never find the movie boring. James Cameron is just so good at creating and building tension and suspense. It's not that the movie is non-stop tension or suspense like The Terminator. But, yeah, that and he's so good at getting you to care about characters, getting you involved emotionally, you know. There's none of his movies, like, you know, I already mentioned not a fan of True Lies. I'm not indifferent to it, you know. I, I kind of hate a lot of what the characters do, but I've never watched a James Cameron movie and sat back and thought, wow, okay, whatever. That's just not, you know, I, I'm not saying that doesn't happen to anyone, but that's never been my experience. So, and this is also, this is a movie where not only the good guys, but also the bad guys fight with smart tactics, which is of course harder to choreograph, but also much more satisfying, both to choreograph and to watch. And I would say there's, a, there's a, the right amount of, like, tension and suspense. It's not so much that it's exhausting, which 
has never really been the case. No, no James Cameron movie, in my opinion, crosses that line, but it's not as action-heavy as some of his other movies, as his outright action movies. So, that brings us to the music, and let's see the... Yeah, you know, it's it's very mysterious, suspenseful, tense, works really well for what they're going for. The, the, there's 47 minutes worth of the soundtrack free to listen to here on YouTube, and yeah, I I did that, I recommend you, you know, as always, please also watch the movie, you know, appreciate the, the entire thing, uh, you know, but yeah. And... The um, yeah, the the sound design is is excellent. There's a lot of stuff in this movie that doesn't make the noise that the movie has. Yeah, that the movie makes it make, and it always feels uh, you know real, and and gets a, a reaction out of you. And, yeah, so, as far as pacing goes, personally, I think Titanic and the Alien Special Edition use their long-running times well. And certainly, I see a, a strong case made for watching the director's cut of Terminator 2 compared to the theatrical cut. You know, the, these are movies that accomplish a lot. I don't think either Avatar movie needed to be just under or over three hours. And overall... No, not this either. I, I I, don't think it's good for the movie that it is so long. And I, I, I'm not opposed to long movies. You know, I've already mentioned Titanic's Aliens, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings trilogy. You know, there are some movies that need to be long. And, I, you know, I will go to bat for the... I think they're called extended editions. The, the longest versions of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I think that, you know, there's a couple of things in Return of the King that I think, oh, come on, that was, I get that you thought that was cool, but it kind of undercuts this other thing, you know, you might already know what I'm referring to, but there's a lot of really amazing stuff there. Uh, you know, those are movies that, like, don't they end up being, like, four, four and a half hours, you know, that, amazing. I, I wouldn't cut you know, but this, it just, yeah, and, and, you know, like Avatar 2, this movie changes genre at least once over the duration. I won't give away how many. Personally, I think it works for both movies. I don't hate it like some people do, but I will definitely grant that the movies he made that do not do this work much better, and it could have been avoided in both of these cases. So, yeah, I, I hope that Avatar 3 and, and 4, and... Yeah, I hope that the next Avatar sequels do not change genre over the course of it. I really think that the best work he does is when, you know, he, he sticks with the same overall genre. But yeah, the... the I guess I could just real quick, let's see, the... The theatrical cut is around 2 hours and 20 minutes, according to IMDb. 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 Now, the special edition director's cut is 2 hours and 36, uh, 36 and a half minutes without end credits, and 43 and a half with. And it's one of those, like, there's music over the end credits, but other than that, you know, you can, like, start doing other things once the end credits start running and not miss anything and I would definitely say that I think the movie would have been better if it was significantly shorter I I don't think it needed that much time and and again I'm not saying that all the the stuff I already mentioned I I definitely do th prefer the special edition to the theatrical and, yeah, at the start of the second spoiler section, I will talk about what I think should have been changed on a script, 
at the script stage. But yeah, uh, let's see. I think if you give it maybe 45 minutes, if by then you still don't really care about what happens next, you know, if, if you can turn the movie off without, like, upsetting someone or something, you know, yeah, the rest of the movie might not be your kind of thing either. So, the, yeah, the, the best element, it's a, it's a tie, you know, I love the underwater photography, I love Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio as yet another badass woman, you know, female character in a James Cameron movie. Then we have the, yeah, the camaraderie between the, 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 crew the the characters you know the the worst aspect is is a tie between how miserable James Cameron made the I, I realize he was also made miserable but it was not necessary especially when you consider it like the end product it's not some mind you know it's 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 not it it changed it it let it it opened the door for more movies to be shot wet for wet as they call it where underwater scenes are actually people under underwater being filmed with you know instead of the the smoky you know smoke machine slow motion footage on a on a stage sound stage you know but it was not necessary to go this hard with it, you know, and, you know, com comparatively, like, I would definitely say his use of high frame rate in Avatar 2, that I can see, you know, really going and influencing, I, I could imagine that that might become a thing, like, yeah, and, and 3... 3D in Avatar 1, high frame rate in Avatar 2, you know, now every action movie, almost, is 3D, you know, and yeah, I could say, you know, it's a little too early to tell because it came out, what, six months ago, but I could see Avatar 2 leading to a lot of action movies being high frame rate, you know, so it's not, he he is good at that kind of thing. I think he he misjudged this one, and it's probably because he loves this undersea stuff, you know. And I get, you know, if you think it's cool for you yourself to go diving for I don't know how long people go diving for, but whatever, you know, for for however long, you know, I get thinking, oh, this would be amazing in a movie, you know. I, th I think everyone who really loves movies, there's probably at, at some point you 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 know you you see or hear something, and your mind goes, "That would be so cool in a movie." You know, maybe it's just a piece of music, maybe it's like it's like you know they have actually made movies, you know. But, well, um, there you know, yeah, there are movies that at least claim to be completely one, you know, one long take, the way that a number of video games today handle things. There are, there's at least one movie that's, like, supposedly a, a first-person camera all the way through, Hardcore Henry, I think, you know, maybe I'll try to watch it at some point, but I, I remember watching the trailer and, like, low-key getting a headache, so I was like, okay, I'm not going to be able to sit through a theater showing of like, I don't know, 90 minutes or something of this. I think it's super cool that they made it. But, yeah. But, you know, that that kind of thing. Yeah, I've, I've played first-person shooters and thought, this would be so cool in a movie. And, you know, so, yeah. the the Right. I'm not saying the POV and first-person shooter are the same thing. I'm saying, based on what I've heard about Hardcore Henry... It seems like it is, like, very action-oriented, and parts of it may be like a first-person shooter, you know. Right. A tie between that and the message being preachy. 
those are the worst aspects of this movie. Now, the worst something I saw a number of other people say was the worst thing about the movie that makes sense to me is the pacing. And yeah. But but yeah, um let's see. Overall, I wouldn't say that those things ruined the movie. Like you basically just, you know, there's sadly there's a lot of movies where you basically just have to say to yourself I'm just I'm gonna put out of my mind the production itself. I'm not gonna think about the the kind of thing you know if you want to be able to enjoy it. But yeah, <clears throat> I do definitely think that the message being preachy is it uh, it doesn't ruin the whole movie, but it ruins parts of the movie. And for some people, that will mean the whole movie. I don't think the pacing ruins the, the movie. The thing I was most worried about was that it would just be self-indulgent, because, yeah, we get it, James. You really love undersea exploration. It's not for everyone, you know. But overall, like I feel like he gets... I, I didn't feel like the movie... I, I do think that the movie justifies how much of the movie is, you know, underwater and on this underwater base and such, which, you know, yeah, some didn't. The thing I was most looking forward to was Michael Bean and 100% exceeded my expectations. This, yeah. Now, the trailers do, at least some of them give at least a little bit too much away. Some of them give you a good idea of what the movie is like. The cover and poster do not give too much away, but also don't really give you that much of an idea of what the movie is like. Just kind of implies mystery and... Yeah. Now, the movie on Rotten Tomatoes has an 88%, which is certified fresh from critics, based on 51 reviews, 45 of them fresh. An 83% audience score based on over 100,000 ratings. The average rating being 4 out of 5. The consensus reads, The utterly gorgeous special effects frequently overshadow the fact that The Abyss is also a totally gripping, claustrophobic thriller, complete with an interesting crew of characters. On Metacritic, it has a 62 out of 100, based on 14 critic reviews, 7 positives, 6 mixed, and 1 negative. And, yeah, the negative one, the rating is 38 out of 100. And, yeah, he says, it's not abysmal, but it's a replay of hits we've already seen. And that is definitely, yeah. Um, I can't go into that without spoiling, but I will talk about that in spoiler sections. And let's see. Yeah. Um, let's see. The the user score is seven point six out of ten, based on one hundred and twenty two ratings, one hundred and one of them positive, sixteen mixed, five negative. There are no negative reviews, but the, let's see, there are two that are mixed, and let's see, yeah, one person says that romance and action is average, and another says the movie is too long. Yeah, this is the guy who thought the worst part was Lindsay, because of masculine behavior, but... Yeah, you know, by and large, very well-received movie. Right, there's also IMDb, which gives it a 7.5 out of 10, based on 183,000 user votes. Now, the, yeah, 31.6% of that gave it an 8. 25.5 gave it a 7, 14.8 gave it a 9, 10.5 gave it a 6, 10.3 gave it a 10, 3.9 gave it a 5, 1.5 gave it 4, 
0 0.7 gave it 3, 0 0.7 gave it 1, and 0 0.5 gave it 2. So, yeah, well received, but there are there is a chunk of people who really do not like it. Then we have, there are 500 IMDb user reviews, 396 if you hide spoilers, and the, right, the, um, the IMDb external review section has 94 links, 58 of them work and are in English, and let's see, right, here we go. Yeah, so I, I read the 100, including spoiler ones, the 100 top voted um, IMDb user reviews. And let's see, one person gave it a 1 out of 10 for, of the 100. 4 gave it a 2, 6 gave it a 3, 4 gave it a 4, 8 gave it a 5, 4 gave it a 6, 11 gave it a 7, 29 gave it an 8, and eight, 18 gave it a 9, and 15 gave it a 10. So the most popular user reviews are the ones that think very highly of the movie, by, by and large. Now, the... Uh, that brings us to the special effects. I'm of course not going to be comparing the. I'm not going to be holding it to a an unfair standard. I'm going to hold it to the standard of other late 1980s effects. So the output of David Cronenberg and John Carpenter in the 80s, and by that standard, it's the the effects are very very good. Uh, some of them are downright amazing. The the effects serve the story and atmosphere. They don't distract. And let's see. Yeah, and some of the special effects are photorealistic. Now, the. Yeah, and there's mass to the CG. There's not quite as much weight to it as would be great, but it's super early CG. So I'm not gonna. Again, I'm just saying. Overall, yeah. And I, I do. Th I, I wish that there was at least a little bit less CG. Uh, now, let's see. So, yeah, the practical special effects hold up, and there is some solid model work. Like, you, you're you sitting there, and you find yourself thinking, wow, they, they built this whole thing underwater, and then you catch yourself, no, of course they didn't. It's a model. You know, it's that convincing. You know, keeping in mind, model work is still being used today. You know, the, it's, it's, a, it's a type of special effect that, you know, it goes back to the first Star Wars movie and it's still being used today for some really big budget. You know, not everything today is CG. So, it's, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's an incredibly, ah, uh, what's the word? You know, it, it is, it is a type of effect that really holds up. And thankfully, those the practical special effects make up the bulk. There are a few visual effects. Most of them convince. There is at least one that I kind of wonder why it was left in, because it is distractingly fake. And I already mentioned the the CG. There's a, at least a little bit too much, and it is it is ultimately a little self indulgent. And that's you know we know James Cameron loves special effects, and again like. I seriously respect, he's never let a movie, he's never in any of his movies let the special effects take over the movie. Again, you know, Michael Bay, Steven Sommers, you know, like these are directors that I eventually just have to stop watching because it's like, can you just, can you just let the actors act and the, the you know, the scenes breathe, not everything has to be a million miles a minute not every not every frame has to be cg calm down okay you know and it's just with james cameron that never happens but he did push it a, a tiny bit far. and it's actually it's a little it is surprising because the cg that's in terminator 2 is convincing you know it's it looks dated but i i think it's i think it would be silly to claim that it isn't still convincing you know it's if, if it doesn't work for you it's probably because you know how they did it by now or you've watched the movie so many times you know but you know avatar like he kept postponing until the 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 technology was there so 
I'm not saying that this movie should have been postponed. I mean, photorealistic CG, we're, we've reached it fairly recently, but like, I mean, was it maybe around 2016? Th thereabouts, you know, movies that, that go further back tend to have at least some CG that just isn't completely photorealistic. So, it's, yeah. Now, the, there's some really excellent stunt work. And, yeah, so it's not, the, the movie doesn't have, like, a huge amount of really, like, um, yeah, what's the word? Um, it's not a, an especially violent movie. The, like, sexuality doesn't go, like, yeah, completely, yeah. And, um, let's see. Yeah, there's, there's, the violence doesn't tend to be, like, there's there's some disturbing material, but the violence doesn't tend to be like crazy, like just yeah. Um, let's see. right, right, and there is um, yeah. I already mentioned disturbing, yeah, and I mentioned the the profanity, yeah, and yeah. So so you know. I mean, I I wouldn't show it to a 13-year-old, especially if you don't want your, your, you know, if you don't want them going around saying shit constantly. Like I mentioned, there's 25 S words in the movie, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would pretty much say, if you're watching a James Cameron movie, you know, I, I think they should all be R-rated. I think... Or, or at least, I, th I think they should be shown, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you you choose what's best for, for your, your kids, teenagers, and such. I would, I would vote for, you know, reading the, the parent's guide to a James Cameron movie before showing it to someone 13 or younger, and yeah. Let's see... Uh, that, yeah, so there will be a couple of links in the description box to stuff that, are these all articles? I think these are all, oh, right, right, two articles, one podcast. And, right, so the, the DVD, the special edition two-disc DVD comes with this booklet that describes the exact differences between theatrical and special edition. The, there's also both the theatrical cut and the special edition of the film. That is one thing, if you just really want to watch the special edition, I would maybe vote for buying a DVD that only has that one because certainly the, the version I have and, you know, yeah, some versions in circulation if you buy one that has both versions, that means that it's going to play normally if it's the theatrical. And if you choose to have it show you the longer version, there's going to be just like... Sometimes it's just like a second or less. Sometimes it's two or three seconds of lag or stuttering when it inserts one of the extended. And like... Other than obviously distracting you from the fact that it, you know, it's it's only a movie, I should really just relax. It is. There's at least once where I actually wasn't able to see, like it. The, there was clearly something. It, it was just like it was a character reacting to a piece of news, and it went by in like two or three seconds. And I couldn't tell what they were doing. I could I could recognize the character, but because of the stutter and lag, I couldn't even you know, I I, I can guess what the reaction was, but yeah, keep that in mind when you're shopping for this. There's an eleven minute 
behind the scenes featurette, a 59 minute behind the scenes documentary called Under Pressure, which uh, actually, yeah, and, uh, teaser trailer, main trailer, reviews trailer, cast write ups. All of it is worth your time if you care about the film. I think there were a couple of other things. Uh, the, um, you know, if, if you're buying, you can read what. Those were the ones that worked for me. They're, you know, I, I did buy this used, and the movie itself plays, so I'm not going to complain. I, got, I you know, it was, it was a great deal. And yes, I did buy it specifically so that I could do a vlog on every single James Cameron directed movie. And I am looking for options for buying the... I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, uh, Strange Days, which is now the only movie that James Cameron has written but not directed that I haven't done a vlog on. I have watched it. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, it's my favorite of the ones he's written but not directed. It's the only one I love of them. Yeah, I think ultimately my, my rating of this is... Seven Undersea Adventures out of ten. And, yeah, uh, I wouldn't rule out watching this again soon. Um, you know, if I had to guess, maybe a month from now. And, yeah, um, this is, you know, of the, of the ranking. True Lies is still at the bottom of the... But yeah, this is the second to, it's the lowest ranked James Cameron movie that I love. And, or at least come very close to loving. So yeah. And yeah, the, the ranking again, you know, so other than True Lies, I love all of them. All of them are amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. True Lies, The Abyss, Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Titanic, Terminator 2, Aliens, and Terminator 1. And before you ask, yes, I have watched all of them recently. I'm not going off, like, nostalgia for any of them. You know, I, I watched all of them leading up to, to doing, you know, the, the... For sure, like, True Lies, it had been, like, a year or two. Titanic, it had been, like, what, 20 years or something? Or 15, some, something like that. And, and this one had also had been 19 years, you know, but... Yeah. The the um, right now it's probably Aliens is the one that's been the longest and I I think is it I guess it's more than half a year because I rewatched it before Avatar two but yeah it's a movie I've watched like twenty times so yeah and that brings us to the spoiler sections. So yeah, from here on out, the rest of the video contains spoilers, and th yeah, the rest of it, this you know, this is the thoughts section start. So the rest of it is not a review, but a series of thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some is MSC 3K riff tracks and other jokes. And uh, yeah, so the first section is notes taken while watching. Those are in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the last section is notes taken before watching, and that was in the weeks leading up to doing this video. <clears throat> All the stuff I could remember before. Notes taken while watching. So, yeah, Virgil is way out of line criticizing Lindsay's new partner. Let's see. Yeah, we realize the SEAL team are there for the nukes, not to save anyone. It was a cover story, so civilians wouldn't realize what was going on. Incredibly tense, intense, and suspenseful when the crane collapses and the crew have to deal with a cascade of failures. You know, just, like, I don't know... If James Cameron, like, at some point in his formative years was, like, trapped in the same place for a while, or maybe he struggled to make friends or something, but he is so freaking good at making these movies that isolate main and major characters, you know? I mean, has he made one 
where they aren't isolated in one way or another. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that he had, you know, yeah, sometimes it's like an entire crew. It's like nine people or a dozen people, uh, you know, this and aliens have, you know, slightly extended cast like that, but there's always something cutting them off from, I mean, in True Lies, it's just the fact that they're spies, you know, it's spy stuff. He can't, like, get some random person on the, the street to help him, but just, he's really, really good at it, and yeah, you know, at the start, it's like, no, 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 don't worry, we'll, we'll be in contact with the up above, and then the storm hits, and the crane breaks, and the cascade of failure, and it's like, we only have oxygen for so and so long, just beautifully done. Simple but effective filmmaking that when we get close-ups of Lindsay and Bud and the NTI is uh, really close to her, to, to the face, you know, the, the actor's face is bathed in blue and purple light. You know, when they were filming, they had filters over the lighting. It's a very straightforward trick, but it works. And, and you know, he understands that you can't just show the effect. You have to have a reaction shot. And when you see, you know, Ed Harris or Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio looking on in awe and their face is covered in blue and purple light, you know, it works. You're, you're sitting there, you, you empathize with them, you feel like you're seeing something that just, yeah. Incredibly tense when we realize Coffee had a gun behind his back and later when he cuts himself under the table. Under the table kinds of things. Guns and knives and what have you, starting some shit. And the NTI ROV made of seawater is effectively humanized by the use of POV and its movement being reminiscent of a shy but curious child. You know, no, nobody, like, when Coffee sees it and thinks, oh, dangerous, you know, we as the audience think, no, no, it's not dangerous, you know, but he didn't see what we see, keeping, keeping that in mind, you know. But yeah, you know, like, this, keeping in mind, this was three years after Aliens where James Cameron terrified us with the xenomorph so you know he clearly did not want to do that again here so it's it's a very yeah he he had to handle it very different like compare the way that the NTIs are filmed and the score compare that to the way that xenomorphs are filmed in aliens you know and the the editing of scenes that feature xenomorphs versus pseudopods, I guess they're supposed to be. And NTI, I'm gonna, because I'm not 100% certain if, is pseudopod the, the purple bluish angelic creatures, or is that the seawater ROV? So, anyway. But, the, yeah, really, really well done. And it is this thing, like, James Cameron, he genuinely does not seem interested in making the same movie twice. Like, he always changes something up, you know, as as many similarities as Terminator 2 and Avatar 2 have to the first movie in that uh, series, he does change some really significant things, you know, and yeah, he did not want to make another Aliens, which I think a number of audiences kind of would have been very happy if he had, but yeah. You know, he did. He didn't want to make aliens, but now it's under the sea. You know, there's some there's some clear similarities. Again, you've got the you've got the isolation. You've got this difficult living condition kind of thing. You've got the extended cast and such. But he didn't want to just say, you know, oh, there's some really dangerous things down there. Jammer wakes up just just in time to knock out a seal. I never thought I'd be saying the words. It was great when that white hick punched a seal, but here we are. Great fight between Bud and Coffee, both fight dirty. As silly as the fight underwater is, I can't claim that, like, I find it very exciting, personally. I, I, yeah. He's really, really good at doing action. What can I say? There's, there's no action scene that I, that just leaves me completely cold, of, of his. The cold drowning and resuscitation, especially the line that includes you've never backed away from anything in your life, now fight, does get melodramatic. But I can't claim it doesn't work on me. <laughs> like, as I'm sitting, you know, afterwards, I'm like, that was ridiculous. But as I'm sitting there, I'm like, come on, you can do it. <laughs> 
and it looks like Bud won't be able to get safely away from the nuke after disarming it, but the aliens come to his rescue. So the aliens are sending a tsunami and one idiot media personality insists on staying? I mean, that's gotta be, like, commenting on people getting obsessed with news stories, but it's so brief and there's not really anything else in the movie that supports it. Like, the, the growing tensions between America and Soviets, that is really, you know, nicely... Like, there's enough of that in the special edition, at least, that that works, but the, yeah. Are we 100% sure that it wasn't like, because that's William Wisher, apparently. You know, are we certain that it wasn't just that he thought it would be kind of funny to, to say that, and James Cameron was like, you know what, that's, sure, go for it. Bud asks why the aliens are sending tsunamis, and the answer is very clear they can watch American television in the 1980s. I mean, that and the nukes. But it's mostly television. And the aliens bring the crew back to the surface, reunite Bud and Lindsay, who is now happy to be referred to as Ms. Brigman for the first time whole movie, and apparently since they got married at all. And sue me. I think it's sweet. I think it is legitimately, you know, yeah, the, the marriage was healed. You know, the... When the when when things get bad, the you know they they realize no you know what we are really good together we can actually yeah. I get that James Cameron himself doesn't want to make a sequel to this movie and never planned on it even if this wasn't a hellish production experience, but this is one of the reasons that I love the MCU. If this movie was in the MCU, you bet your ass there would be a follow-up where characters would go exploring the alien city instead of us just seeing it so briefly. I mean, I know a lot of people really hate Ant-Man Quantumania, but at least we go there. There's so many of these 80s and 90s movies where it's like, <gasps> See, look at this amazing thing for 30 seconds, and now the movie, you know, it's not always at the very end of the movie, and sometimes it is more than 30 seconds, but just, yeah. That brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So... Right, yes. So, obviously, the movie is way too long. It should be only a little more than half as long as... Uh, yeah, as it is. So, I have a couple of suggestions on how to get it there. Now, the changes I have in mind, again, would require the script being different. I'm not saying the following could be accomplished just by re-editing the movie. First of all, considering that basically the only thing that comes of the supposed rescue mission is that the SEALs get their hands on the nuke, I think part of the movie needs to be that part of the movie needs to be trimmed down significantly like aliens opens on people checking a vessel what it does not do is show the people talking about how to carry out the checking it's, you know it does not spend minutes on them checking before they find the thing that is important to the plot so basically i think that's the way to go as much as i love the cascade of failures you know ultimately from the science fiction aspect you know, from that point of view, this movie is about getting the humans to the aliens, and the cascade of failures really slows that way down. So, maybe trim it down to a third of what it is. Maybe have it lead directly into catching up and disarming of the nuke. Like, maybe Coffee makes the decision to get the nuke to where he wants it to go during the cascade. Maybe he even causes the cascade. You know, maybe there's some kind of thing of, like... You know, it would have been okay, but he went and pulled a thing or opened a door or something, causing the cascade of failure so he can get to the, you know, yeah. Drop the hostage situation, the physical fight with coffee. Basically, just have, like, coffee almost immediately succeed in getting the nuke into the abyss itself, trim down the resusc resuscitation, get faster into Bud pursuing the nuke and disarming it. And let's see. And considering that the aliens are gone for much of the movie, I'm not sure I think it should open on something that clearly is not human technology destroying the American nuclear sub. I realize James Cameron also has xenomorphs very early in Aliens, but that entire movie is about the xenomorphs and humans dealing with the, them and the, the fallout of the, the uh, what's it called? 
uh, the shake and bake colony and, and such. But this movie, you know, first it claims to be a rescue mission, but nobody actually gets rescued. Nobody is found alive. Then it's about them surviving in this underwater station, and then finally we get back to the aliens in like the second half or last third or so. I didn't know the exact time. And when they finally show up, they change their mind about the tsunami within minutes of it even being established in the movie. I realized that at that point, the movie is also saying that the aliens were responsible for all of the storms in this movie. But considering that we only learned that minutes before they changed their mind, it just doesn't hold as much weight. You know, while I'm cert almost certain that what I'm about to say is not what happened, it feels like James Cameron, near the end, suddenly realized the movie was going to be really long, so because of that, there's only a few minutes between the tsunami and the alien stopping the tsunami. Again, compare this to basically every other James Cameron... Yeah, every other James Cameron directed movie. When the crap hits the fan, the movie has enough running time left for it to really hit the audience before it is resolved. Like, next time you sit down and watch a James Cameron movie, which I certainly hope you will, try to notice how much time is actually left when, like something really bad happens that informs the rest of the movie. And, yeah, actually, that... Maybe originally... Maybe he thought that the cascade of failures would happen later in the movie, and then he changed his mind, not realizing how much time that would leave. Yeah. While I, of course, don't blame him, and I'm not going to pretend he's the only one, I think the Cold War kind of broke James Cameron's brain, at least for a while, with one obvious exception. Each time he made a movie that was clearly commenting on that, it came out extremely preachy and felt like a child's understanding of the conflict. Like, this is not the only movie he made where basically the message is that we have to be nice to each other, and if not, nuclear annihilation. Now, as a progressive, I of course approve of a pro-empathy message, but it's substantially more complicated than be excellent to each other. Also, it does feel like he basically just grabbed this entire idea from another movie. He didn't really change anything. The movie I'm referring to, while it would be a spoiler to name it, was 38 years old when this movie premiered. Older than James Cameron was. And it came out significantly earlier in the Cold War, so in addition to being original at the time, it also got a super obvious story told soon after the conflict began. Like, come on. From a sci-fi pers perspective, could you think of a more obvious story to tell about the Cold War than aliens don't like us trying to, you know, don't don't like us nuke the, the idea of us nuking each other. If we don't stop, they will kill us, you know, or, or hurt us at the very least. Like just it's it's the most obvious thing. And and to do it so long and like keep in mind, the Cold War started like I guess 40, 1945, basically. This movie came out 44 years after the start of the Cold War, and it doesn't really have anything to say other than it was bad, okay? And you know, if they were aliens, they might be you know, the I mean, I don't necessarily hate the line, you know, they want us to put away childish things for a while. You know, for sure, like I there's a there's a scene in The Great Dictator, the Charlie Chaplin movie where he plays a parody of Adolf Hitler, wherein like in real life he would have been Stalin, but in the movie it's Mussolini. The two dictators basically fence each other with, like, baguettes. It looks pathetic. It looks ridiculous. And that is essentially what Hitler and Stalin were, were doing. And, and in general, you know, a lot of, you know, when, when you have a, a leader of a country who doesn't really accept negative feedback and, and questions of his authority and such, yeah, some of them just keep throwing everything they have into this battle, and it's like, because cause that's, you know, they were literally a chunk of the, the battle in the Eastern Front was Hitler wanting to take Stalingrad, because it's named after Stalin, you see, and Stalin didn't want that to happen, because it's named after him. And millions of people, I, I forget the exact number, but tens of millions 
of troops died because these two man children couldn't you know yeah just like so i agree it is childish you know we the the idea of nuking someone it it comes from a very immature place it's not any kind of rational logical answer to to you know but to just have aliens just have someone who's even stronger and they're gonna say don't do it because we can destroy you you know just 44 years into the cold war you gotta be bringing more than that and this movie came out only a few years after a graphic novel against Naming which one would be a spoiler, but it's amazing, did much more with the, the same idea, you know, so just, yeah. And it also makes it harder to accept Cameron expressing progressive views in the messages of his movies and interviews and such when he isn't living them when working on movies he puts actors and crew through extreme things like it's true he doesn't ask someone else to do something he wouldn't do that that's something i've noticed i think every single michael bean interview where someone brings where the interviewer says is it true that he asked you to do this that and the other thing and michael bean will very calmly respond james Cameron." I think he calls him Jim. Jim doesn't ask anything of you that he wouldn't do himself. And that's great. That's great. But he still, like, you know, he really put all these people through the ringer. You know, he doesn't have to go to these extremes. Other progressive directors don't. Let's see. I mean, the... the uh, Ryan Coogler, I, I'm going to double check. Because I feel slightly... But Black Panther Wakanda Forever also has... Yes, directed by Ryan Coogler. Also has scenes that, like... Okay, that could get extremely un unpleasant. And, like, you know... That also has underwater scenes and, and such. And I haven't heard any... You know, they... they you know the effects people were abused although that's not down to Ryan Coogler that's the st Disney themselves I haven't heard of anyone like getting hurt like people got hurt making this there, there were a couple of people who almost died including Cameron himself you know so just yeah now let's see yeah and and the movie shows James Cameron's distrust of the military how eager they are to choose violence so it did surprise people who were used to James Cameron ending his movies, shall we say, somewhat differently than this, and that is definitely something that has bothered a number of people who might love it if it didn't do that. And before I say, oh, just because people were surprised, you know, maybe, you know, it should be a good thing, the movie really does seem like it's building up to an action movie climax, and then instead it turns out, you know, the aliens are easily dissuaded and... The, the tension just gets diffused without, you know, just, yeah. Um, and it really is... The technology wasn't there. But can you imagine if it actually ended with, like, oh, they, you know, they, they bring Bud back, but only to tell him, you know, we're going to, to kill everyone. And he has to, like fight his way past some of the aliens, get, like, yeah, tell you what, the, the, you know, he'll ask, who made this decision, and they'll, like, flash, uh, I, let's see, I guess they don't really, do any of them have names, not according to the movie itself, we, we could just have, you know, they, they show, like, yeah, maybe the, the guy has, like, a crown or something, you know, he's, like, he's the scientific, and, you know, they're, they're so logical that they, that their leader is chosen by the person who understands the things the best, which could also be a nice little, because wouldn't that be great if, if the people who had the most power were the smartest and the ones who best understood the issues instead of just the most hateful, the, the ones who were the best at appealing to the hatred of, of a lot of voters. Anyway, 
you know, and, and so Bud, like, makes a break for it and gets past several of them and, and, you know, maybe they, like, fire, what would be a fun water weapon? Yeah, the, like, they flood areas that he's, he's running through or something like that, you know. And the, the, yeah, he, he ends up getting to, to where the, the person is with the, with the crown and he makes an appeal to that person instead of them just saying, so here's what we're going to do. Here's why. Oh, you know what? We changed our mind and here's why. It's just, yeah. Let's see. Or maybe after he, after they make it clear to him, we're going to kill everyone. You know, maybe, maybe the, the, um, they, ex you know, yeah, so, so he, he, um, he types on the keyboard again. And, and like, yeah, yeah, you know, he's, he's typing on the keyboard and, and one of the, the aliens is like, are you, are you telling them to come attack us? And he's, no, no, no. And, you know, he, he types and they see that all he typed was, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for what I did to Lindsay. I love you. Goodbye, you know, something like that. And they're, they're moved by that. But no, the thing they're responding to that happened like minutes ago, you know, so just, yeah. Let's see. It is a huge relief when the ending comes around and you realize that now the world will be safe from nuclear annihilation, and all it took was a humanoid silver robot. I mean, a giant genetically manipulated slimy squid. I mean, pseudopods. That's it. And I copied in a bunch of... Huh. Um... Okay, I think... Let's see, how much is there? So it's from... Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, I copied in some IMDb trivia. So, let's see, so yeah, the, the, um, the, um, the special edition, the, the stuff that was put back in, was cut from the theatrical release, because a um, movie that was almost three hours long was considered too big a commercial risk in 89, especially for special effects driven, special effects and action driven film. Contrary to what may be expected, though, the decision to shorten the climax was made by James Cameron himself was not imposed by the studio. Cameron stated the reactions to the extended scenes during test screenings had been mixed, so he felt that deleting them was the best way to get the film to the 135-minute running time that he had contractually promised to deliver. He also said studio officials were actually horrified by this decision to truncate the ending, question him whether it was the right choice, but in the end, he had final cut. And yeah, the special edition was created in 1993. And, yeah, you know, that, that is interesting, and it does, like, I, I do really respect someone who's, like, that's, you know, we, we need filmmakers to be, be willing to, to say, you know what, that's gonna, that's, that's not making the movie better, so let's remove it. Uh, let's see, and and apparently Cameron himself is very happy that he was able to make the the special edition. You know, he he didn't want to remove it; he just was worried about the running time. Now, uh, right, the scene with the water tentacle was one of the first to be filmed. This was done so as to give the special effects team the maximum amount of time available to develop the CGI over the course of filming the rest of the movie. Now. Yeah, um, the angelic alien creatures and their bioluminescent bodies are based on a deep sea jellyfish that lights up like Vegas. And it is like I I don't think I know any other, you know, like I I I've seen other science fiction movies where there's creatures that live under the sea. I'm not sure I've seen any that, yeah, glow with this biolumin luminescence. But yeah, it's it's true. You know, I've seen. I've seen footage of the real jellyfish. I, I was probably in one of the documentaries that Cameron made about deep sea exploring and such, but yeah. Let's see. The, 
Right. The, the American Humane Association rated the film unacceptable because of the rat that was submerged in oxygenated liquid in one scene. It wasn't an effect. The, the rat really was subjected to the anxiety of being submerged in this liquid where it panics and struggles and is then pulled out by its tail as it expels the liquid from its lungs. And, you know, the, the yeah, the version of the movie I have replaces, you know, we don't see the rat you know, basically, we, we see the rat being lowered toward the, the liquid. And then the rest of the scene is close-ups of people describing what is happening to the rat. You know, Hippie is saying, yes, I, I can see that it's living. It's still, it's still alive. It's not drowning. But it's clearly upset, you know, and the, and the seal says, no, no, it's working, it's working. And then he pulls it out, and then, it, then we see the rat again, you know. I kind of wish that was just how they did it. Again, I did look. I get it. It didn't die. None, you know, they they did it with like five rats. None of them died from it. One of them died of natural causes later. Although some people joke, yeah, it died of anxiety. But there's absolutely no need to show it. You can just describe it. And and that's the kind of look. The rat doesn't understand it. You cannot explain to the rat this thing that's normally dangerous for you that's deep in your like instincts it's okay it's safe the rat is never going to understand that like I doubt the rats like I, I don't know maybe maybe some of the rats were put through it more than once and maybe eventually they realized but certainly the first time you put a rat through that it's not gonna understand so like I can I can understand doing it with a, a person who can who can logically understand, but yeah. Let's see. Right to create the alien water tentacle, Cameron initially considered cell animation or a tentacle sculpted in clay, animated via stop motion techniques with water reflections projected onto it and certainly he's gotten a lot of great stuff out of stop motion you know I, I like I'm still really impressed by the stop motion in the first Terminator movie you know so but but yeah let's see uh, yeah while looking for a company to create the effect Phil Tippett suggested ILM which had just taken its first step steps into CG with young Sherlock Holmes. VFX artist Dennis Muren, who had been setting up CG division within ILM, worked on the effect for nine months, with the idea to resort to claymation in case the CG effect did not work. Fortunately, the finished effect proved even better than expected because there was no... there was, Oh, that's right. Fortunately, because there was no more time to try another technique, so yeah. But it, it does look very, very good. And uh, yeah. Let's see. And. Uh, yeah, I copied in a bunch of stuff about the horror of making it. Um, the film is reversed in Coffee's first close-up after the pseudopod scene. This makes his expressions creepier in a subliminal way. I really love when they reverse film. I, I just... There's some great use of it in the first Sin City film as well. You know, famously, some of the... There's a... Yeah, you know, in, in I guess... Maybe that's a spoiler. At least once in uh, the original Star Wars trilogy, when someone like pulls a lightsaber into their hand from afar using telekinesis, what they did was I forget if he tossed it or if it, it was probably pulled out of his hand. I, I don't if if they he tossed it and then. Yeah, I, I don't remember, but one of those, and then they reverse the film, and it looks completely convincing, you know. And let's see. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, so more IMDB trivia. James Cameron, you know, it's trademark that he has the there are nukes in the film. 
Right, and Michael Bean get bitten on the arm by another character, and this is apparent. I I don't know what James Cameron has against Michael Bean's arms and hands, but every single time he appears in a James Cameron movie, he gets bitten on the arm or hand, and like I mean. Bean himself must be cool with it because, like, I feel like after a while, like, dude, what is what is your problem? Yeah. But yeah, like, the the just yeah, and yeah, James Cameron films feet when the soldiers arrive at the supply ship, jump out of the helicopters, which is of course, you know, it, it culminates in Lindsay getting out of the helicopter, and we see her high heels. Which is legitimately a completely ridiculous, like, I guess he thought it wouldn't be enough for her to just be wearing, like, slightly more feminine, sh feminine shoes than the others. Like, no one in their right mind would wear high heels to, in into that kind of situation, like, where they're landing, it's wet and it's like, you know, moving in the, in the water. And she knows this because this is what she does. Like, just, yeah. Let's see. And, right, it was Michael Bean who, after reading an early script, suggested to James Cameron to let his character Coffee suffer from HPNS, high pressure nervous syndrome, as an explanation for Coffee's increasingly rational behavior. He also grew a mustache to add to the menacing nature of his character. And it is kind of ridiculous that James Cameron. But, you know, it shows they, they work together well, and it's a really great, like, the movie does not work if Coffee is not suffering from HPNS. The, it just completely falls apart. And, like, yeah, the fact that, that Cameron, like, look, I hate the military, too. I don't, you know, there's a lot of things that I hate about the military. But the idea that someone who's that deranged would continue to be a regular military officer for a really long time that's I'm I don't buy it it's just not you know but yeah it absolutely saved that character it would have been completely ridiculous I mean honestly I almost feel like maybe it should have been like I was I was thinking of like rewriting it to where maybe someone on the down, someone is is like actually Russian and not like in favor of the Soviet Union but like that's part of why coffee flips out because he he sees a Russian and he assumes they're working for the Soviets and and like maybe he doesn't mean to maybe he's just trying to get the nuke away from the Russian he doesn't mean to get it down to the aliens you know, I mean, the idea that he would believe that it's Soviets that far down under the water is just completely, like, I buy it with HPNS. I do not buy it without. Now, let's see. The scene with the water tentacle coming up through the moon pool was written so that it could be removed without interfering with the story because no one knew how the effect would come out, which that's that's a really smart way to, to handle that. The actors were interacting with a length of heater hose being held up by the crewmen. When the effects were completed, they exceeded everyone's expectations and wildest hopes, paving the way for increased use of CG in films. The actors were interacting with a length of heater hose. Yeah, that makes sense. Because, you know, they, they have to have something that can that they can react to, both when it's right in front of and just when it's moving near them. And let's see. The final shot of the movie is of Bud and Lindsay embracing each other, but they aren't played by Ed Harris and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. The shot was filmed with two extras after principal photography was completed. And let's see. Right, so the yeah, the the uh, tidal waves. The effect was initially realized as a plastic wave by ILM that had not been finished when the film was screened for a test audience. They only saw drawings of the scene with, and got polarizing reactions. People listed it either as their favorite or least favorite. James Cameron himself felt that it almost belonged in a different movie. That is true, yeah. 
And yeah, he removed it since the movie was too long. Anyway, years later, he regretted the decision, so he went back to ILM to finish the wave with computer generated special effects, reinstated the scene into the special edition. And the lesson he learned was to never ever preview a movie with unfinished special effects, which I also just like, look, I get it. You spend a lot of time seeing the movie before it's done. You know, you, you have to keep in mind what the movie is going to end up looking like through a lot of like, you know, okay, now actor imagine that this is going on right in front of you and and all this stuff I still find it fascinating that he would ever consider previewing a movie with unfinished effects like that's just nobody who works nobody who only people who work within like movies and in general creative fields like also if you're like painting something uh, you know, developing a video game. Don't show people something that isn't very, very close to that. Like, sure, you can have, like, video game testers, you know, that kind of thing. But, like, don't show a regular audience something that isn't very, very, basically finished before the, yeah. Let's see. Right. Ed Harris and Michael Bean also appeared together in The Rock. Bean also played Navy SEAL in that film, but their parts are reversed. Harris playing the antagonist, being 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 one of the good guys. And yeah, so in the ending of the special edition, the antagonists show Bud videos of humanity's destructive behavior on a screen on their ship from news sources. One of the clips shown is the Bay Lop execution video, one of the most infamous pieces of footage from the Vietnam War. The victim was a 36-year-old Viet Cong officer who was arrested during the Tet Offensive, brought to a South Vietnamese officer who wasted no time in dispensing justice, executed him on the spot. And yeah, I, I do, that is something I really respect about James Cameron. He hates the Vietnam War and always, always finds some way to to express that hatred you know like i guess is maybe is there anything in titanic i think that might be the only one that doesn't have any you know like even if you want to say well I'm not about terminator terminator is very much film you know aliens and this super obvious how they're commenting on the vietnam war but if if you look at the Terminator, the way they're fighting is very reminiscent of like Viet Cong, uh, kind of you know sneaking around, hiding, and using you know only a few, but very well played. Like statistically speaking, like you know the Americans like threw a crazy amount of bombs. The the Viet Cong were much more targeted, you know. So yeah, the the you know. The first Terminator, the flashbacks that Kyle Reese has basically make you feel like you are a Viet Cong fighting the Americans. So, yeah. Despite being the film's antagonist, Michael Bean's character gets killed with just under an hour of the movie still to go in the special edition version. The press kit sent out was a beautiful box made of sturdy material with the title on the cover. Inside it contains the stills of the entire cast plus the deleted scenes the wall of water hovering over the world's greatest cities. If the beings weren't regarded, weren't regarded, they would have destroyed mankind as if the great flood occurred. The aliens in the movie are a reversal of the aliens in James Cameron's previous movie, Aliens. While the latter had no eyes and giant mouth, the aliens from the abyss have giant eyes but no mouth. And it's very much about, you know, to be fair, he didn't design the the xenomorph that was it was you know, it was designed by hr giger r.i.p regardless but it was designed for the first alien but when hr giger designed it like the fact that you know not only does it have a mouth it has like another mouth that comes out like very aggressively you know it's it's the kind of thing that really triggers our anxiety on a very very instinctual level you know we just yeah, we, we think of something really dangerous, and if you can't see, if you can see a living thing's eyes, then you can try to judge, you know, are they friendly or are they dangerous? 
so the fact that the xenomorph have no eyes make them especially creepy to us and the the aliens in this you know giant eyes which makes them seem more human you know and and like i don't think there's a single shot where the their eyes look like angry or dangerous to us and yeah the the mouth immediately you know it makes especially if the creature isn't going to talk anyway it they they don't emit any noises from so yeah you know so yeah th they don't need a mouth technically and yeah to remove it it just like you know no matter how much time you spend looking at them no matter how you feel about them you never think are they gonna eat me which is one of the you know the moment that you see someone's mouth especially if it opens especially if there are sharp teeth which again xenomorphs you know sharp teeth and there are a lot of shots you know, if, if you if you need a drinking game try to notice how many shots of xenomorphs feature the xenomorph with the mouth open there there it's very rare for you know sometimes we'll see the mouth open in the shot but it's very rare for an, a shot of the xenomorph's head to not feature a, an open mouth because it just it's, it's, yeah Michael Bean says his character will be seen as the villain, but he doesn't see it that way. He feels the character's in a really bad situation, trying to make the best decisions, but he makes the wrong ones. And I, you know, I love when actors feel that way about, you know, yeah, I don't know if villain antagonist characters, you know, it's it's great when they feel that way about it. So some critics. Critic quote, he's not really the villain, he's sick and needs help, but the movie and the other characters treat him like he's a villain. He dies like a villain, his climactic scene treats him like a villain. The, the fight between the ROV, the, yeah. It all culminates in an underwhelming, albeit visually beautiful, climax that is less emotional than the films Cameron seems to be inspired by, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 2001 Space Odyssey, and more of a rushed deus ex machina. Very true. And... Yeah, I've I've seen various people nickname this close encounters of the wet kind, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's yeah, like I I know I'm gonna get crucified in the comments. I have not watched Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I haven't been avoiding it. I just it hasn't been on sale anywhere that I've looked. But I I hear that that one is very much about like the wonder of it. And from what I understand, that movie spends more time and focuses specifically on the aliens. You know, that one doesn't say, oh, it's a rescue mission. Oh, no, how are they going to stay alive on in this place, even though bad things have happened? It's just about the the aliens, you know, and I just, I wish that was the case. And, and 2001 Space Odyssey, I'll grant that the focus shifts somewhat over that movie, but it's more focused than this one is. Despite the fact that, like, it's not always about the same characters or, you know, some of the scenes take place, like, a long time apart. Like, it literally opens at the dawn of man and, you know, then we're in space. So, yeah, with, you know, man is traversing space. Man is, uh, yeah. And, let's see... Cameron takes the viewer into La La Land at 16,000 feet below the surface and proceeds to launch into a polemic against the state of the world. This, then, is a lesson for all storytellers and directors on how to turn many viewers off. Guaranteed, for the remainder of the movie, there is as much excitement and thrills as there is at any political convention. I don't mind polemics. I really like good action thrillers. But polemics belong in the documentary genre. Yes, I know the movie's trying to be a metaphor for the abyss of nuclear warfare, but we all know that nuclear war is a no-win situation anyway already. And I think that's a really good... So that's the thing. Like, look, nobody, nobody needs to be logicked out of mutually assured destruction because they weren't logicked into it in the first place. Like... Let's hypothetically say that you, yeah, let's say that you were trying to convince people, no, we don't need diving suits. We can go, human beings can go as far below the water or as far into space without any suits, 
it's fine. You're going to have to really bring A-game arguments. that are going to have to be really, really logical, and you're really going to have to bring receipts there. But mutually assured destruction was always just an emotional thing, and, and going in and saying, well, what if there was a third party who would destroy us all? Like, the, it kind of just changes the, the power balance, but it's the same end result. You know, it's just, it's not... It doesn't... yeah. Right, and one person says, if stupid dialogue doesn't bother you, this is a very interesting, unique film. Unfortunately, it's a it's Cameron directed movie, which means you get... Uh, yeah, the, the leads are people you are supposed to like. Uh, you know, Elizabeth... Ma Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio and Ed Harris, no strangers to playing hard people, they spend most of the movie yelling at each other. This romance is so stupid it's insulting, as is the ridiculous New Age alien visitors ending. That is the perfect way to put that. New Age alien, yeah, that's, yeah. Let's see, and, and this user reviewer feels the same way about Titanic. Unlikable lead characters ruined what could have been an excellent adventure movie. Let's see. Uh, there was also something that puzzled me when this film ended. I understood that the aliens only saw bad in humankind, hence the reason why they were intent on destroying the human race. Presumably, this is why they attacked the nuclear submarine at the start. However, what I couldn't understand was why they didn't destroy Bud and his team when they had the chance. I understood why they didn't at the end when they realized that not all humans were bad, that humans were capable of loving each other. But they didn't know that at the start, so why did the aliens spare their lives in the first place? It's sloppiness like this that brings the film down despite the fact that it has a good message and surprised me by being something different to what I expect. See that? There we have a, a review written by someone who did like that it was different. Now, the... But, but yeah, it's, it's very true The the... Uh, let's see. Uh, right, I have more to say about that, but there is another... Yeah, I have more quotes that get into that. It's also clear Cameron never seemed to know which direction to take the film in. It starts off as a mission to rescue survivors, then it becomes a film about hunting down supposed alien life forms, then we get the cliché crazy characters intent on destroying the aliens with a nuclear warhead. Cameron is usually a good storyteller, but the film is so sloppy, lacking in focus, and poorly conceived that it just becomes hard to take it seriously. I think it... This is essentially like the reverse of Avatar. With Avatar, Cameron had a story he wanted to tell, but it would have been better served as a miniseries. As it is, it's really, really rushed. They hand wave a lot of things away and there's a lot of narration and montages to get to where uh, you know Cameron like the movie Cameron wanted to make with Avatar it's, it's maybe the last half of the movie or so and the first half is basically okay there's some stuff in the first half that he wanted in there but a lot of the first half is just trying to get to the part where he can do the thing he wants to do and then, yeah, with this, like, I think it would have been a really cool short film. I don't think that the, the um, let me explain. The, the thing he started with was this thing of a submarine goes missing, everyone disappears, you know, what was it, like one person survived, but they have death into psychosis, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, like... Horror movie, uh, 20 to 30, horror movie, sh horror short film, 20 to 30 minutes, we're following this, this crew, and they, you know, they, they dive to a, a certain depth, and things start happening, and it ends tragically, with maybe all of them dead, maybe one survives, but it's like a, yeah, like a, like a H.P. Lovecraft kind of thing, you know, they, they can, they can ramble on about, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the blue and purple lights, the blue and purple lights, some, something like that, you know. Um, in case you made the very ill-thought-out de decision of using the angelic-looking aliens, even though it's now a horror story. But yeah, the 
I don't think because because once you know once once the the crew go down and say nope yep yeah, they're definitely dead you know then then it has to become a different movie and I mean it's James Cameron likes to start his movies with a bang he likes to start it with something that grabs your attention and that's smart because it means that you're you spend the rest of the movie hoping to see something you know something more come of that but the fact that the movie does open with the the destruction of the submarine and then we spend a while before you get I, I don't think when did they get to the rescue maybe 20 30 minutes in or something and it's like I'm sorry was this about aliens because where are the aliens now let's see I would have even given it a seven or an eight or even an eight if at the end the aliens just swept humanity off the face of the earth and ended the human race because that would have been a cool and logical from the perspective of the aliens move and would have made the ending much better even though the reasoning for their desire to wipe out humans was presented in a really cheesy way it was m more funny than impactful it was like one of those anti-drug PSAs from the 90s telling you hey you see this apple don't smoke okay That's pretty funny. That's a that's a good. I try not to laugh at my own jokes, but I don't feel bad about laughing at other people's jokes in these videos. I I feel like that might be a slight overstatement, but certainly like what was the thing with like oh you know check out this egg you know being being was this is your this is your brain, and then you know the the egg on a on a pan it's being fried this is your brain on drugs any questions and it's like what the hell kind of metaphor is that? like was that was this written by someone who doesn't like fried eggs cuz like I mean not in every form but I think eggs are delicious it just makes me hungry to see someone like this is your brain ah yeah, not, not into raw eggs go go talk to Rocky Balboa instead and then he fries and oh that looks good can we can we put a little bit a little bit of cheese maybe a, one slice of bacon on that it would be amazing but the anyway <laughs> hey you see this apple don't smoke okay yeah that's a I don't know maybe it's not actually a, an exaggeration maybe I just have I haven't seen all of the American PSAs once again I'm Danish let's see now about the aliens so if I got this right the aliens were observing the humans to see what they do and when they and when the first submarine that went down they started doing all that so humans won't launch a nuke but wasn't the reason the seal guys wanted to launch it was that the aliens wrecked the submarine that submarine in the first place or were they already going to nuke Russia and the aliens tried to stop them because what the movie says is that they had no such intentions things only got ugly between the US and Russia when the submarine was destroyed and I think that's the thing like sometimes I used to write fiction so I know firsthand sometimes when you're right you know you have a you have an end goal you kind of forget early on and that you know it's extremely important to go back and and check your work and maybe also have other people read and and you know see if they have questions because clearly he wanted the movie to end with like oh Soviets might nuke America this is gonna go bad but the that whole thing was started by the and 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 it's such an easy fix cuz at the start they're like what's happening you could have had it be okay we're almost maybe maybe they're trying to get to a spot where they're gonna launch the nuke but then you gotta make that clear because that certainly wasn't made clear nothing they say made that clear you know that I'm, I, yeah they had like a mission I'm sure but yeah like that yeah so so just have the the yeah anyway or, or if not I guess maybe he didn't want to make it clear in that first scene because then the rest of the movie people are focusing a lot on that but have the seals say I'm, I'm almost certain they didn't uh, you know I don't remember every single line spoken in the movie 
but just yeah have the seal say we're finishing the mission you know but the they actually the other seals tell coffee you can't launch without authorization from above so they didn't have authorization they're not finishing a mission that the other submarine was going to carry out so just like i mean as far as i understood from the movie the seals went for the nuke because they didn't want the russians to get the nuke like basically you know and and then they had to make a cover story you know anyway if Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio's character is such a bitch, then why doesn't she ever act like it? And that's a really good point. And honestly, I feel like the the I feel like the answer is that the you know people say that she is a bitch because a lot of men feel threatened by a woman who's confident, and you know maybe that's what the movie's trying to say. But again, I don't feel like the movie completely lands it because it doesn't, like, yeah, honestly, like, just have, like, a character near the end look at Lindsay and say, you know what, you're all right. The, so, some kind of, like, I mean, there at the end, she kind of melts and says, you know, says, and, and is happy being being called Mrs. Brigman, but, like, I don't, I don't really feel like that's enough considering that the entire movie up to that point Everyone is constantly acting like she's just completely awful. Now, let's see. Master Antonio had this when she was becoming a bigger star, but her character is weird. Everyone keeps calling her a bitch, but yet she seems perfectly reasonable for the whole film. Michael Bean's loopy Navy SEAL playing essentially the same part which Stephen Lang played in Avatar, which I will say, I still... You will not hear me say a bad word about Stephen Lang. I think he's amazing. And I, I've seen him a little bit other than that. But when I think Stephen Lang, I think the Avatar movies. But watching this again, I could really understand why, you know, Cameron had already cast Sigourney Weaver. And he, you know, yeah, he didn't want people to think, oh, it's, it's aliens again, you know. And, you know, there's not really anything in Aliens that would make the the Stephen, Stephen Lang character in Avatar, you know, that similar to Hicks. But this movie, yeah, it's really, you know, like the Stephen Lang character is more stable, but... Yeah, it's there's a there's a very clear resemblance there. I I do really hope. I mean, maybe Michael Bean could play like a relative of his in one of the. I yeah. Uh, there has been a severe shortage of Michael Bean in James Cameron movies. Basically, uh, right. I didn't want to give away. Right. You know, here at the very start of his career, Cameron put Bean in three movies, and then since, just, no, like, I'm not going to claim that there's a role for him in Titanic or True Lies, but, yeah, like, one of the, you know, when I watched Avatar, I distinctly remember thinking, why did they, why, why did James Cameron go out of his way to find a different Michael Bean instead of just hiring Michael Bean because he can play villains. You know, he does here, he does in Clock Stoppers. Let's see. This is one of the lesser known films of James Cameron. It contains all the elements of his earlier film that his earlier films were known for big set pieces, ballsy action, Michael Bean, but this film is not in the same league as other. Cameron's other 80s films, Terminator Aliens, it starts out as an alien ripoff. That's very true. And and this is right after he didn't do an alien ripoff. You know, aliens didn't feel like it was just alien again. But here, it's it's alien, but it's underwater instead of in space. Like you have a you have a crew of people going in, something you know, something bad happens to their technology and they have to deal with yeah. Let's see. Instead of monster in space, we get monster in deep water, but then the monster is sidetracked and turns out not being a monster at all. And the focus is on the fight between the good guys versus Bean. 
great climax with a superb acting Harry tries to save his ex-wife is then followed up by another climax a messy meeting the alien scene that feels more at place in a light-hearted Spielberg film very true the abyss is solid in the first 40 minutes when the fear of drowning and a monster in the water is played out with great suspense just watch the sequence where they first entered the missing sub but in the end the film tries to be horror thriller sci-fi epic all in one and fails unfortunately the special effects still look good though the same story is told better in less time in other movies. The movie has no real story, it's just people reacting to things over and over. I think the movie would be a lot better if you took out the aliens and it was just about nuclear tension between America and the Soviet Union. And it's, yeah, I, I absolutely, like, it's extremely rare for me to, to call for less science fiction in anything. Like, I agree that not all science fiction is equally good, but I don't, I'm not sure there's any movie that, uh, where I feel like, okay, this movie would be at least a little bit better if you took out some of the science fiction. That's, pr I, I would pretty much always just, you know, I, I would say you need to adjust some of the science fiction, but outright taking out, but yeah, like this, and you wouldn't even have to, like, Here's, yeah, here's a, a quick suggestion for how to make a movie without aliens. You can have it start the same, but in st start similar, not the exact same. Instead of a, you know, this, this alien life form, it's a, it's a Soviet sub. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they have some new technology that the Americans are not aware of yet, and they, they're able to take out an American nuclear sub the American military realize it, and now, you know, they have to get the nuke from the sub that was sunk before the Soviets do. And, you know, the, the, let's see, yeah, and, and you could still have the, the, you could still have the message that we have to not destroy each other, you know, have, have the, um, ah, that's, that's a spoiler, I guess, but there's there's other movies during the Cold War, especially in the 80s. If you can change, and I can change, everybody can change. You know, the, the, have have a big speech at the end. It can, you know, have Bud, like, maybe there's a, there's some kind of, yeah, you know, it, it ends with, like, a, a conflict between... The, the Soviets and the Americans, and then they come to recognize each other's humanity, and, you know, they both refuse to attack each other, and Bud, like, delivers a speech, maybe, maybe specifically to, well, let's see, what would make sense? Maybe the UN, maybe, maybe NATO, maybe, maybe some Soviet official or something, you know, and he explains, you know, the the you know we've both been so focused on how the other per how the other is the enemy we've forgotten that we're all human beings you know you even if you still wanted even if James Cameron still wanted this really hokey message at the end you know you don't need aliens for that especially if the aliens like I mentioned before are not actually going to change things it's just the third player in the same overall you know it's the same outcome. It's just like, let's see, if mutually assured destruction doesn't get people to not fire nukes, maybe if you have a third party who's going to destroy everything without nukes, then no nukes will be fired. You know, it's it, like, yeah, I, I, uh, that is everything that I have to say about the movie. So, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite underwater, you know, any kind of, like, whether it's science fiction or horror or mystery, any combination. You know, yeah, let me know. If you like this movie and you want, like, this kind of, I, I don't know if anyone's still playing it, but I definitely recommend the video game Soma. Uh, you know, 
really, really solid and clearly, like, when I played that, it had been years since I watched uh, this movie, so I didn't realize, but, like, that definitely took inspiration from from this one, and I think that one does a really solid job of a similar concept. Now, I'm not saying that they should do a Soma movie. I think a miniseries could work, but a movie would not be able to do the themes justice. Anyway, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's a pseudopod seawater water tentacle heading for a nuke and you're suffering from HPNS. Uh, let's see, right, I've done vlogs on, yeah, I have now done vlogs on everything that James Cameron has directed, and the only thing that he has written that, that is fiction that I haven't done a video on is Strange Days, and if I, I you know, I'm, I'm looking for a place to, to buy that, and we'll probably do a, a vlog on that, but, but yeah. There is a playlist. There is a playlist in the description box that will take you to like the overall James Cameron vlogs I've done. You know, if you if he's directed, you know, Terminator and Aliens have both had a lot of like later additions to the franchise. So you know, the the playlist will link you to a Terminator vlog, a Alien vlog, and from there, in the description boxes of those videos, you can find my other videos. Because I've I've done, there's a couple of games of, of Aliens and Predator I haven't done, but other than that, I've done all the Alien Predator movies, Alien vs. Predator movies, and all that. All of the Terminator movies, uh two of the games, you know, but, yeah, let's see, and, yeah, there should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now, I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, as well as one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the most recent episode of True Lies, and the most recent episode I've personally gotten to of Scream Queens. And yes, I'm aware that my most recent, the most recent episode of True Lies that I've gotten to is not the most recent that Americans have gotten to. You know, here in, in Denmark, they're, they're being put on Disney+, Plus, but weeks and weeks after Americans have seen them. In other, and recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalogs. What's catching next week? I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time. Remember, you've never given up on anything in your life. Now fight. <laughs>